Okay, okay, let's see here. How are things? Can you hear me? Excellent. Welcome all to my official uh, Twitch stream takeover. I'm super excited about this. Oh, I'm silent. Oh, that's unusual. Let me turn that up a little bit. How's that? Cool. All right, I am going to start uh, some of the music. So one thing that I uh, wanted to do was play some music while I'm talking today, but it should be fairly quiet. I'm going to keep it relatively low. But this is coming from all the games that my team and I have made over the years. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's do some pretty cool stuff here. So today I'm going to be talking about plugins or add-ons as they're known. Um, this is kind of a sort of a complex topic um, and there's a lot of information out there already. So I am I would not call myself an expert by any means but I, I do uh, do a lot of plugin development. So if there's anything that you want to know about, feel free to ask. Um, I have my discussion topics on the left. Feel free to ask any questions about those. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. And uh, right now you're listening to music from Boopal Snoot Adventures. This was a uh, woodland game for the Cozy Autumn Jam last year. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is not even talk about um, plugins or add-ons in the first place. The first thing I'm going to talk about is actually the tool keyword. Because the tool keyword enables just about everything you can imagine in Godot's engine. Because what tool does is it lets you run code in the editor itself. And that is super interesting and super cool. It's something that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize they have access to necessarily do is write their own little tools that help them to program their games, uh, frankly put. And so you can get a lot of, yeah, we were really happy with Boopal Snoot um, Adventure. And uh, I can't remember who came up with it. It was, I think... Uh, Gamma Goat, who should be here shortly, uh, maybe a half hour. But um, yeah, so the tool keyword, let's talk about that first. Yeah, Case is one of my teammates and uh, definitely a Gamma name. Yeah, I agree. Kaishido, who is also here, is uh, my other teammate. So um, if you want to ask about music, you can ask Case. Case is musician par excellence. And, as is Gamma, actually, and Kaishido is our art director, so he's just an incredible art creator and is able to kick stuff out much faster than anyone I've ever seen. Um, so getting back on topic, uh, tools basically run code in the editor. Now you can see I have my editor plugin here set as tool, but it doesn't have to be that. You can just have a tool that runs anywhere. Oh, hey, it's Lodovic. Nice, nice to see you, man. Good to see you. Been a little while. Um, and I think probably my favorite thing with tool scripts is just being able to change things at in the editor and, and actually see the changes. So, like, if you make a tool script that um, handles, let's say, adding padding to controls, it sounds like a weird thing because why would you want to do that? Well, you might want to make a resource to handle your padding. And if you want to make a resource to handle your padding, you can make a tool script that imports that resource. And whenever that resource changes, you can then use the tool script to actually update what the thing looks like in the editor itself. And that way you don't even have to run the game to see what your changes are, which is super nice. Um, by the way, I didn't actually introduce myself very much. Uh, you might know me as the developer, the main developer, and certainly the main um, maintainer these days of the Godot Firebase plugin. 
Um, that's sort of why I'm, uh, you know, here today. Um, so it will auto-update, but it won't necessarily auto-update in the editor if it's not a tool script. You'll see it update in the game when you run it, but if it's not a tool script, it doesn't do the updating. So that's pretty much why Spoon Gun. Um, yeah, as you can see from my little description, I, uh, I do a lot of cloud-based technology development. I'm a cat dad, and I work for Ramatok. Um, feel free to ask me questions about any of these things, anything that uh, I talk about or anything that's in the discussion topics on the left. Um, so with tool scripts, you, they don't have to be plugins. You happen to see one on the screen right now, but they absolutely do not have to be. You can pretty much build anything to be a tool script. You do have to be very careful with them because they run in the editor and the editor has, let's just say, to put it in layman's terms, it has fewer checks for the code. Like for example, if you free something that is doing physics calculations and it's in the middle of a physics calculation, you're likely going to get a crash. Um, it's way more, it's both more strict and less obvious what those checks are. And so you have to be very, very careful. And a lot of the times, one of the things you want to do with tools is make sure that you are, uh, if you're an editor hint, they call it, uh, mode. And what that does is it prevents your stuff from running in the game necessarily. Um, so like you see here, I've got an event, or I should say a, a signal connection. And I just check to see if uh, you're doing any of these specific events. And uh, because of this, I need to check to make sure that it's in the editor so that this code just straight up will never run in any game that actually gets published with this. And so what I'm going to talk about for the main point today, aside from the tool keyword, which is literally my favorite in Godot, um, are plugins. I like to think of there as being actually two types of plugins, but there's way more than that. There's four or five, um, yes, exactly. Tool scripts don't have undo, redo, so that is really very important. Thank you for that, Outfrost. And uh, same thing with, uh, actually, so tools can do undo, redo, actually. Sorry, let me, let me clarify. Tools can't, certain types of scripts that you make with tool may not. Um, so, I'm going to show you undo redo with my tool plugin here in a moment as soon as I've shown this. But so what I'll be going through today is creating how I created what I'm calling the script factor plugin. And script factor is a plugin that helps you um, refactor your code base much faster. And you can you actually have access to it. Um, if you want to go to the GNONETS page, you can find it there on GitHub. It's github.com slash godonuts. Um, so it sounds like go donuts. Um, yeah, there it is. And uh, essentially, uh, I haven't published this in the asset lib yet because there's still bugs with it. And it's a pretty complicated one. You know, it's, a, it's mostly code editing, which is a fairly difficult um, thing to do. You know, you need like very powerful tools just to do the code editing itself. Um, in this case, I'm, uh, let's see here, I got some notifications. Sorry, I wanted to, ah, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so basically, um, I think of it as two. There's, there's uh, scripts that you can run one at a time and those are kind of interesting. I think they're not super well known. Um, let me see here. I've got a thing that I wanted to mention about them. Just real quick here. So yeah, there is a thing called an editor script. This is the type of script that is a tool script and does not have undo redo available for this type of thing um, and what you end up doing with it is it's kind of a once-off you actually run it dynamically like not in your code base 
you actually open the script, open whatever scene you want to run it on, and then you can, usually what I do is control shift X, but there's also a file run command that you can hit. And it will just go through whatever scene is open and modify it however you tell it to. So that's actually, to me, that's like a really powerful thing because it essentially you're making scripts that run over top of scripts. You can get the script from the scene, you can edit it, you can modify the scene. You have to be pretty careful. Um, you can find all this information in the Godot documentation. It's pretty straightforward. And if you look under plugins, if you just search for plugins, you'll find, honestly, most of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but then the other type of plugin is just a general editor plugin. This is my categorization, mind you. Um, they do specify subcategories. So there's like main screen plugins, there's import plugins, there's gizmo plugins, inspector, visual shader. And these are all types of things that give you the ability to edit how the code in Godot itself runs, which is, I think, really cool. And, and it's something that you don't get regularly in most engines, I feel like. You can kind of get some in other engines, but the power just isn't there. Like, for example, if you make an import plugin, you can define your own file type. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, you probably know a lot more about plugins than I do, but I'm still going to be explaining these a little bit more here. So I'll go into the different types and what they can do. But for example, with an import plugin, what you can do is define your own file type and tell Godot how to import it. Now, I think that's really incredibly powerful because importing new files is not a trivial thing to do necessarily. In Go, it's fairly trivial, and I, I love that fact. And then you have main screen plugins. This is something like, um, if you're familiar with Emmy, Emmy Coppola from uh, the Godot Foundation itself, um, they've made a plugin called Dialogic. It's a very popular, very powerful plugin for building out dialogue based um, games and dialogues generally. And uh, it's a main screen plugin. And what that means is when you're in the engine itself, you can switch to it up here. You can see I have mine created for 2D uh, rather than 3D. It's missing the 3D icon. But if you if you import Dialogic from the asset lib, it just adds an extra tab over here, an extra uh, button with Dialogic icon, and then you can automatically go to it. You pretty much want to only do those for really powerful plugins, things that need to be accessed very quickly, have their own settings, have all their own stuff. It's very normal to make those, but it's probably less normal to have quite a few of them. Um, yes, agreed, Winston. Completely agreed. Orchestrator is fantastic. I don't do much visual scripting, but I know that people love that. So there's a lot of different main screen plugins that you can get that are very, very powerful. Um, for me, I tend to stick to building um, simpler plugins, things like, well, like Firebase is it's pretty much just a uh, plugin that adds an auto load that gives you access to all of Firebase's functionality that we have available. Um, and I can show that later. I can certainly answer questions about it if you have any questions about how I built it. Um, I did a recent refactoring of it that is very, very big um, and wouldn't mind talking about that. So um, the type of plugin that I have here is actually just a plain editor plugin. It's very generic. Um, and the generic uh, form of it, you can still do basically anything you want with it. The general method of creating them, the way that I do it anyway, hey, Yag, how you doing? Um, is I just go to plugins and you can see I've got mine turned on here already. I just hit create plugin, go through this little dialogue. I don't know if you can see it. I'm assuming you can. Um, let me see what the screen shows. It doesn't. Okay, so it's not picking up my extra windows. Sorry. I'm in project settings. You can't see it, but if you go in project settings and then you go under plugins and hit create plugin, um, it will actually show you the uh, how to create, like, it'll give you a little dialogue for just creating plugins straight away which is really nice. Um, and then you can turn them on or you know turn them off if you need to for whatever reason. 
I'm doing very well. Uh, things are going extremely well and um, pretty happy to be to be here. I'm going to be showing off this plugin for refactoring today that I've started on. I started on a while ago, but uh, <laughs> hey, Gemma, good to see you. Uh, and um, so basically what's going to happen is uh, I'll show this off in the con this. It's called script factor, but I'll show it off in terms of the uh, creation of a game. I've got a game already started. You can already access all of this, as I mentioned, uh, and you can see the link right here. Um, and all this stuff is up online already. You already have access to it. If you want to go through this with me, feel free. Um, I think when you download the project, you'll probably have to turn on the plugin yourself. So you open up the project settings and then go into plugins and hit uh, turn enable on for a script factor. Um, when will the asset store be activated? I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean when I will I have it uh, uploaded to the asset store or what? I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, Ismail. If you're asking when this plugin will be put into the asset lib, it will be sometime shortly after. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. This is going to be going into the asset library, the uh, the free one, uh, and it's going to be going in shortly after. I actually think probably at some point, I'll just open a pull request for the engine itself to implement all this, um, because this would be, to be honest, much easier in the C++ code. Um, generally, C++ obviously is much harder than GD script, but uh, the type of power that I need, a lot of it is much easier in, in C++. So um, I'm going to submit this to the asset lib once I'm done fixing several bugs. And then uh, once I've got that in there, I'll probably start working on the engine uh, version using uh, C++. So I'm going to actually just show you what it does first. And the reason for that is just to see it. Um, I'm hoping it actually you can actually see it. Now I'm not sure. I might have to switch my thing here. I can just do it right in this part here. Select this. Alt-Tab. Ah, it's not bringing up Windows. Okay, let me see here. So if you hit Alt and the left quote, or, or, or also known as um, let, uh, tilde on most keyboards, uh, it will bring up a little thing with rename variable, two variable, two constant, two function. And these all mean things like uh, you can just rename a variable throughout your script. That's something that's just very common. It already exists in Godot. Uh, but I wanted to have them all in one simple place. And they'll have shortcuts that are like one, two, three, four in this case. Um, two variable, you can take something and turn it into a variable immediately. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get this uh, to show my um, entire thing instead of just the uh, just Godot itself. I've got it set to a... Uh, window capture rather than the whole capture. Um, so let me see here. Can I, if I do, what if I just do Okay, let me see here. So that's what you're all suggesting. Let me just see if that works. Um, I thought I had it showing. I gotta go to my actual, here we are, plugin, yes. Um, where do I do the actual pop-up show at? That's over here. 
Okay, so I can probably tell my actual pop-up to do that, is that right? Someone said an editor settings. Let's let's look at there. Um, pop up or let's see here window. Single window mode. So perhaps that's it. Multi window. All right. Let me see what this does. Okay. Single window mode. Let me try that real quick. I have to restart the editor. Clearly, I have to turn off the <laughs> the plugin, turn it back on. I see, so it's going to do that. Um, let me resize here real quick. And let me just make sure it shows up now. Oh yeah, I see a window there. Nice. Perfect. Okay. Now you can see my pop-up, actually, which is nice. Thank you all for the help there. Um, so essentially, what you can do is modify your code much faster and go through... Oh, thank you. Cryptic. Good to see you. And yes, that is one of the massively powerful things about Godot. People think uh, you have to have an engine that takes up gigabytes and gigabytes of size and RAM, and you, you really don't. Um, this is basically one of the smallest engines compared to the number of features that it has, which is incredible to me. So I'm going to show you how this actually works before I actually get into any code, just so you can see it. And you can see in my player base script here, I've got a number of things that are dollar sign sprite 2d dollar sign sprite 2d they're referencing the sprite 2d everywhere it's pretty much all over um, and that's not something i like to have i like to move them into on ready variables and normally what i would do is i would you know cut this come up here say at on ready var sprite equals that oh, i even missed one just a thing there And then replace it with Sprite, and then I'd go through and copy-paste everywhere where it's needed. This little tool lets you do this. So you just select it, Alt-Left quote, two variable, number two. We're going to name this Sprite, enter. We have the variable. It's replaced it throughout the entire script. Everywhere that it's used, instantaneous. You no longer have to do that refactoring yourself. Let's say you have a function that you want to kind of refactor um, and you want to make this, um, you want to be able to call it everywhere. Let's say you're calling something everywhere. I don't have a good example of that. Let me see here. Um, something that I can ex explain why you would want this. Yes, exactly, Gag. That is uh, something that I've been hoping for as well. Um, I might actually see about opening a PR for that as well because um, that's a you know powerful thing that we sort of really do need. Um, let's see here. Okay, so let's say I had this instead, and let's say uh, yeah, I can do that. Give me a second here. I'm going to show you how I did. Uh, and this is with my plugin, mind you, Ismail. So it's uh, you know a lot cleaner. But let's say I wanted, I had this called in a bunch of different places. Let's say I had a bunch of different scripts that all do this. Um, what if I just hit Alt Tab and hit two function number four, and I said let's name this um, place spawn. Now you can see the 
Stuff's messed up a little bit. That's one of the bugs that I have to fix. But it does create it. And it gives you that ability to... It will actually find this code all throughout your script, the entire piece of code, no matter what it is. What I did, it was just in one place. But if you have it in a bunch of places, you can just do this, and it'll just replace it everywhere in that script. Now, right for the moment, it only puts it into one script. Um, in the future, I would like to be able to do things where it's like um, move it to a shared file, like a, a static file, perhaps, or a file that has static functions in it or something along those lines. Right now, as you can see, it doesn't uh, pick up variables. So I need to add something to move uh, parameters up there. Yeah, no mouse clicks. Exactly, Anons, yes. I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name. Um, apologize if I, if I butcher anyone's name. But um, yeah, so, uh, and you noticed, by the way, in my player base, when I did the refactor to underscore sprite, it recognized that it needed the on ready variable. What if I don't have that? What if I've got like, um, let me show you this. I don't know if this is going to work, so I'm, I'm tempting fate here, but let me do this real quick. So obviously calling it up here with nothing has no makes no difference. Uh, Outfrost, to answer your question, at the moment, no. It doesn't understand anything from other scripts yet. Um, it is possible to implement that and to do it fairly smartly with this. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So this is fairly new, uh, mind you. Um, but let's say I wanted to turn this into a variable. And I'll actually do it down here, because this is closer to the variable that I actually wanted to do. And you'll note, this just grabs something from my main screen. I'll show that here real quick. Um, I've got my toolkit in here. This is just something that anyone can use. It's free. There's a, a uh, thing for it in Potato Sack, actually, my, my main company. Yes, exactly. Scott uh, mentioned that uh, they're looking to implement it in the engine itself. I actually am planning to hopefully here open a, uh, if there's not a request, or a, uh, what do you call it already, a proposal, I will open that proposal and otherwise uh, I will probably implement a first pass PR for it if I can get that done. Um, so let me close that, close my sh assets here, okay, there we go, okay, and here's where it's coming from. So I just have my ground layer set up as a group here called navigation. And all that is, um, I haven't even shown the game yet, it's just the sand tiles here. Um, we're gonna actually be implementing parts of this later and I'll use the tool over the course of it. I just wanted to show off what this can do already. Um, so yeah, so uh, let's say I wanted to turn this into a variable. So if you remember, in the past, when I did it with Sprite, it found on ready, it put on ready automatically. With this one, we can do that again, and we'll put in, uh, we'll call it map like I had it before. And it just puts it in that way. It doesn't have on ready. Um, it might need it. That's why I had it this way before, where I had colon tile map layer. It also doesn't notice types. You'll see it replaced it here as well. And that's why I had it that way. Yes, I do have a very large monitor. This is an ultra wide. Um, I would actually normally be streaming over two monitors, but uh, at the moment, my work monitor or my other monitor is set up to my work computer only. So I, uh, it's a little bit harder to show a normal sized monitor, which my, my work monitor is a normal one. Um, but yeah, so uh, renaming variables, it will take into account some context, like on ready, it looks for the. Uh, the dollar sign or the percent sign. At the moment, it doesn't check for get node, and the reason is just um, specific things that I wanted to skip for the time being. But if you have a dollar sign or a, uh, a percent sign at the beginning of a uh, thing, so like animation player, I'm just gonna do it right away for that. This uh, two variable, and I'll name this anim, I'll 
I'll take my drag control and do the same. Drag control, again, is another part of the library that I have out there. It's not a library that's more of a, just a couple of scripts. Um, and I'll say two variable and I'll name this drag. Because this is, uh, you know, Pride Month, I figure every project has to have drag in it in some way. So mine has uh, drag controls, drag areas, everything that you can imagine. This is a simplified little thing that I made. <laughs> I thought I thought people would like that. Um, for the purposes of essentially replacing drag and drop in Godot, because I think the drag and drop is a mess. Um, so what you'll see when the game runs, I actually don't have it being displayed. Um, I will run it in a bit and show you what it looks like. Uh, but once I do that, um, Okay, I can probably increase that. How do you do that? That way? I don't know if that's better. Let me know if that feels better out for us. It doesn't look like it updates. It does not look like it updates my uh, thing, my uh, plugin. Oh, yes. I'm a big fan of the, the uh, colored folders because that's the only way to keep things sensible. Um, I have them slightly off right now. I normally don't use red or green. Um, I don't really have terrible uh, red-green color blindness, but a little bit of it, so it, uh, it can be a little bit awful, but the red and green that are chosen here have been fine for me, so I decided to go with that. Um, yeah, so a lot of this stuff uh, is already built in. Like I said, functions are there, and uh, so just a couple of other things about plugins themselves. You can do, you can change the editor to basically however you want. You can add a dock. You can put it anywhere in one of these spots. Um, so a dock would be like a, a thing to show whatever you want. Maybe your custom file type has a bunch of settings that you need to change. And uh, for the main screen editors, you can do something like, um, tell it that it handles specific types in the editor. And so if you have that type, um, this is not an example of one, but let's say I had a type, a uh, plugin that handled the shakable camera type. doesn't really make sense to do that, but let's say I did. Um, it would actually switch to that main screen plugin up here whenever I click on a shakable camera in the editor, which is super cool. So. You also have inspector plugins. Um, uh, for rainbow folders, you just right click and go to set color, set folder color, and it lets you put in whatever you want. Which I think is just absolutely cool. I tend to put my toolkit on gray because, because it's a toolkit, I don't usually make that many changes there. Ah, yeah, no. Um, much simpler than that, actually. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, exactly. You can make inspector plugins too, which are a little less popular. Uh, what they do is you can actually add stuff essentially over here to certain things that uh, allow you to like add different types of editors in the inspector. <coughs> Excuse me, let me grab some water here real quick. And you can put headers and you can put all sorts of different things in them. Um, so I'll get into the actual plugin that I'm developing now and show you how you do it. Um, the first thing that happens whenever you create your own plugin is it builds out, uh, you'll see it here, I think, if you go into add-ons. Yeah, plugin.cfg. That's uh, the first thing that it makes, and this is just its config to tell you or to tell the engine what it should be looking at. And then it creates plugin.gd. And in my case, this always shows up mostly empty. Um, I've added vast majority of these things. Um, on enter tree, for example, I create my scene. I just preload it um, and then add it, which is kind of cool. Um, <coughs> remember to instantiate it. You couldn't quite see it there because my thing's all <coughs> the larger size is covering it up.
I'm going to quickly update the music. Give me one second. <coughs> this is a different game. I didn't work on this game as much. It's called Branch of Omen. Uh, this was more of the rest of my team, and they did an absolutely killer job on it. <coughs> this is going to be a bit spookier sounding. Hopefully it comes through. I'm going to turn it up a little bit because it's clearly pretty quiet. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I don't have that much experience talking all that much, so... Okay, so we instantiate this actual interface here. Oh, is it too loud? Okay, let me turn that down again, sorry. Let me know if that checks out then a little better, Gamma. Whatever you uh, want it at is fine by me. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we add it. I'm just adding it to the plugin itself. Well, I don't know if that's copacetic or what, um, but uh, the basic idea is that you need to put it somewhere if you're going to be actually interacting with a scene. Um, it needs to actually be somewhere added in the editor. I decided to add it here. I will remove it you know in exit tree and that's fine for uh actual code editing there's a lot of uh sort of pre stuff that you have to set up so i get the editor interface and then i get the script editor out of it um, the editor interface is basically the whole thing grab the script editor and something that a lot of people don't realize with plugins is that you fully can have signals you can connect to them the editor itself provides just a bunch of signals that you can have access to that fire in tool scripts so you absolutely get signals when things change you don't have to like do polling you don't have to check um, you know I, what I noticed is a lot of people are confused about signals like how do they even function in the editor when we think of them typically as more of a game logic type of thing but remember the Godot editor is built with Godot itself. It's built in the Godot language. So you end up, yeah, exactly what Yag said. The editor is made out of nodes. It's made out of scripts and nodes and everything that you can imagine that you're making for your game. That's what the editor is made out of. Resources, it's got tons of these things. So I just connect to the editor script changed with my function here on editor changed. I'll get into that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> that makes it so that when you switch to a different script, the context of my plugin knows, or it knows what the context is, so it knows what the new script is. Um, I have to set the previous editor, and this is mostly just for housekeeping to try to get rid of um, some of these uh, connections. You don't really have to do it for this one because you're only connecting once to this because you only care about like it'll connect only once it'll fire multiple times but it'll only connect once but with GUI input <clears throat> because you have to kind of switch between things um, you have to connect kind of dynamically so the first thing I do is I just get what I'm calling a previous editor here I'm just calling it that because it's the current editor in this case and later I'll use the previous editor to remove the event um, or the signal I keep saying events because I'm a C-sharp developer used to be uh, primarily C-sharp. So if I say event, I mean signal also. Um, but yeah, so you take the previous editor, you get the base editor, get the GUI input, and you connect to it with on event. And on event, again, I'll show that in a little bit. I just have this helper function to add all my things. You can see I've got parameter, so that's something that in the future I'll be implementing. Um, sorry, let me see what this question is. Yes. Um, well, I can't really speak on behalf of the team, but what I believe I, I know is that uh, this is in regards to Ox Apollo. Um, C Sharp is going to stick around. I mean, what you don't see, what you don't hear about is we have there's support for dozens probably of different languages, not just C Sharp and, and um, a GD Script. GD Script happens to be the primary one 
uh, developed by a lot of the team, but yes, exactly, according to Scott um, and Yag, uh, both. Uh, there are plenty of people who develop C Sharp, who like C Sharp, and who use it exclusively. So um, that was part of the reason that I got into Godot originally. I actually ended up switching over to GD Script myself because I find it to be less verbose. Um, probably many of you are going to be like, you lying sack. Um, but I actually find C Sharp to be very verbose and uh, I just don't like writing that much code in terms of that. Like, if I'm going to write that much code, I'd rather write in C++ or like something else. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a really good, uh, really good repo to go over. Yeah, and GD Script is so nice to work with. Um, I, I think uh, as we get uh, tools like this, like the one that I'm building here, and as we get them in the engine, it's going to be a lot better. Um, but you can see, like, I've got uh, there's just this little helper function, and all it does, honestly is it adds children for my um, my class that actually handles like putting in a name. So like putting in a name, that's generic between all my editors because why wouldn't it be? It's the same thing for all of them. Um, it's the same thing for functions. It's the same thing for variables. Um, I have uh, an extra editor that I want to add for adding parameters and what that would do is it would take a variable or a value that is in your current um, function and so-called raise it to become a parameter in the function. Um, there's some very serious design choices around that that I don't want to make, frankly. Um, so I, I have decided to leave this out for now. Um, Yeah, I could put on word wrap. I assume that's here. Yes, good call. So it's a little bit weird looking because of the fact that there's commas and stuff, but uh, hopefully it is understandable. If if any if anyone has trouble with that, let me know. And instead of that, I will just make this all larger um, and get rid of this thing for the time being. Yes, that's exactly the way I think too, uh, Oxpolo. There, let me get rid of that. I'll just have it much wider. Hopefully that is something that everybody can see now a little bit better. A lot of these lines, I don't like having them that long, but um, this is much shorter than what I had originally. Let's just put it that way. Um, so I'll explain like all these things that I've got here in a little bit um, to const. I mean, all these things, I say default extractor. That's just the thing that I have defined up here. I'm loading this item name interface. That's the thing that gets the name from it. So it will uh, extract any information that you need. So you can actually put in your own custom one and it will uh, it'll extract it. It'll put up the display, whatever control you've made. Um, for my interface, it's just a very simple, um, essentially a line edit with a pop-up. Um, there's nothing very special about that. And you can custom make any of these very, very simply and add them. Um, all right, let me bring this back so I can switch back up real quick. Okay, um, and they all use it too. That's the thing. The, this extractor, it just pulls out the data says here's what needs to be replaced and here's the value that they want to replace it with. And I've got validators. Um, the validator, what that does is it says whether or not the name is valid. And it's a very, um, it, it's ridiculously simple. Um, I only have this for name validators at the moment, but in the future I'm going to be doing arrays of validators so that you can put in anything. So like if, um, uh, for example, if a if a uh, a, a function like for my um, function 
uh, refactor, if it's not a valid function, what you're replacing, then you don't want to actually let them do it. Um, so in this case, uh, I don't have that, but it's because that saying what's a valid function, like the selected value, is that a valid function, is sort of a difficult thing to do. So that's part of the reason I want to implement that in C++. It's probably a lot easier there. They probably have a lot more access to those things. Um, but then I have these replacers, and these replacers are just the specific things that say, here's a template, basically. This is what it should look like when it's done. Go to town. And then you put in the name, whatever you want to display, and the key for it. Super nice. I've actually removed regionize here because Godot actually already supports that. And uh, I hadn't realized it when I was building this originally. Uh, it's just Alt-R if you want to add a region. So like if I wanted to add a region here, just Alt-R um, and put in region, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you get that automatically. So that's really nice. And that was actually a big part of the original reason why I started making this, that and variable extraction. Um, I have a thing where I set the plugin to self. This sounds weird, but uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, yeah, I mean, I usually just type it out myself also, but uh, now that I've found out it exists, I do that all with the, uh, with the shortcut. But I do set plugin because I don't like uh, checking parents, so i pretty much done away with get parent in most of my code, except for, I don't know, maybe something else. Um, and I'll show you what that does in a minute. And then you see this main screen change.connect. Now, one of the things that you don't see in here is main screen change anywhere. It's not defined as a signal. And that's because it comes from the base editor plugin. You can see the signals down here, main screen change. So that means like when this screen changes, anything to anything what happens well it gives you the actual screen name so in this case it's script i believe let me just double check and see if that's what i had in there i think it is yes script capital script uh, you'll get 2d in here from this you also get 3d if you've got the full engine you get asset lib. I think these are exactly what you get. Um, it's it's a, not necessarily what you see here, but it is a value that's defined uh, for these things. Um, and so I'm plugging into when it gets script, so that just tells me if I can pop up. In other words, if I go to 2D and I hit Alt left quote, it doesn't do anything, and that's important because you don't want to be like putting two. Uh, variable in here that it doesn't mean anything um, but here it makes absolute sense so for my ad editor all that does is uh, some boilerplate add the child um, define its shortcut set up the actual editor itself with the validator replacer and the title um, give it the shortcut this is the so this is the editor shortcut and this is just my definition of a shortcut so it's easier to reference and then this handles empty context that's a, a function or callable that um, normally you wouldn't want um, normally you wouldn't do it the way that I did it but it's a callable that tells you if this particular uh, refactor will uh, be able to, if there's nothing selected, to be able to do it, to be able to just still function. And the, that one was made explicitly for uh, regionize because you can just add a region anywhere. Like, it doesn't have, you don't have to have code selected. Um, I hit the wrong button because I'm so used to doing that. If you hit Alt R, I believe you should be able to, or maybe it's only. Maybe I found a reason. Yes, I did. <laughs> Apparently with Alt-R, you have to have something selected. So I did find a reason why I might keep regionize in there, which is you can just add a region with it. And so it becomes just this, and in this case, it would be five. There's no five available, so it doesn't, doesn't work now. But um, yeah, that's 
largely all that ad editor function does. So this plugin, yes, exactly. <laughs> this plugin uh, is actually very, very simple. Um, exit tree, all that does is it frees the actual plugin that I created earlier. So that's this thing and gets created here. And then it disconnects from the script editors, editor script changed from that one signal that I had added. Okay, and then on editor changed, if you remember, if we go back now to that was the function that was added to editor script change. So let's go down and see what that does. So I get the current editor. I check to make sure it's not equal to the previous one. That has some, that's because of some weird um, some, uh, things that happen in the engine. Um, and if it's not equal, and also the previous editor is not null, then I disconnect because that's when I know that I'm hooked up to that GUI input event. I disconnect from it and then set the previous editor and reconnect to it. Interestingly enough, I could actually do this here. Let me do this to function. Let me say um, connect GUI input. Now this tab is different because of, like I said, a bug. But connect GUI input is now actually in two places. Or should be. Okay. Looks like it's not because of a slight difference, but that's what this would do. Um, let me just see what it does. Yes, exactly. I had it formatted slightly differently, so I can just put it in there. And that'll do the exact same thing now, which is what I wanted. Um, note that if uh, I had GUI in or previous input. That's why it missed it. So it's looking for an exact replacement. What I would like to do is find near replacements as well, but uh, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, often requires some um, different algorithms called like uh, Levenstein distance and various uh, very confusing thing. I'm not going to go into those uh, today or edit distance, things like that. It actually exists in the editor already, but. Um, it's not something that uh, is what I really wanted to implement for this GD script version. I might do it, like I said, in the, in the C++ version if I can get that done, but uh, otherwise it's not super relevant. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, the majority of the code is in my pop-up menu for script factor, and I note I do have this as a tool, but something that's really cool about this that uh, I don't know if I actually showed it yet, so someone was mentioning earlier that you don't get um, undo redo without special code. You actually do. Um, it's only in um, the editor scripts, the ones that you run once, that you don't really get that. So you have to be careful and make sure you save everything. Um, with editor, for this, I don't know why, but for this particular um, uh, plugin, I have all of the undo redo that I want. So, like, if I were to do again like uh, sprite2d.texture equals, uh, I'll just say null for the time being. If I wanted to turn this into a variable, again, a different one, well, you don't do it by right click. Um, are you asking if I am John Godot? No, I am Kyle or back at 50 feet. You can type in exclamation point streamer to find out more about me. Um, let's say I wanted to make this into a variable again. Um, and I'll just say underscore sprite two. Uh, and I'm like, oh, you know what? Obviously this is not right, um, how it's supposed to look, that's fine. Um, but I, let's say I wanted to undo it. I can just hit undo and note it undid it. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, I have not had to mul uh, do anything with editor undo redo with this in large part, I think, because it's all text based. Um, hello and welcome. Um, so obviously when you're selecting this, you don't put the variable. That's not the variable that you're trying to put out. That's why it had all the, the weird errors. But um, yep. So because it's text based, I actually get undo redo for uh, by default, which is really nice. 
And um, yeah, so I thought we would actually continue developing on this game. Um, let me show the game so you can actually see it. I have to uh, bring up a thing to actually show what it's supposed to be. And it's not very pretty right now, despite um, Kaishido's incredible work. Uh, let me just add another stream here. Game capture. Pacific window. Okay, so it didn't grab the, uh, the window title, that's fine. Um, the idea here is everyone outlined in red is a bad guy. Everyone outlined in blue is a good guy. You control the good guys. I haven't made this fully function yet, so I'm going to show you all the different uh, things that I'm going to have to do for this, and it's going to require a lot of refactoring. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of build it in let's say kind of the dumb way first. I'm going to put that in quotes, dumb. It's not actually dumb, but it, uh, it seems like a lot more work, uh, or a lot less work, but it leads to not necessarily bugs, but weird things. Um, and then we'll actually uh, show what it does. Now, I've already got drag and drop partially implemented. Something you can do is you can drag your characters around, and you can see barely. It's very small. I apologize about that. But... The drag is not available here. So when I let go, it just goes back. But if I come up here, this is where it's not implemented. If I let go, it just disappears. So I'm going to implement it flying to that spot now. All right, let's get rid of this. Hopefully. Ah, yeah. Window capture, game capture. Let me get rid of that. There we go. Um, let me start implementing this, and I'll show you uh, what I can do with the plugin as I go through it. Okay, so I've already got getting the A star path from this thing. I'm just using the new A star grid 2D. That's new, I think, as of 4.0 or 4.x, one of the new 4.0, 4.x uh, um, updates. Super powerful thing. Just says define a full region. Everything's connected in it. You know, next to each other and then you can just tell paths through it. How I managed to implement the, um, not the drag and drop feature per se, but um, the uh, being able to tell if you're allowed to drop, let me get rid of some of these things here, or let me go into, so you already see my drag control here. All you have to do with that, actually, if you go over here, you can see in my signals, I've connected to drag canceled, drag started, and needs data. These replace Godot's equivalents, and Godot doesn't have drag canceled. Um, there is a, a way to sort of tell that a cancel happened, but it's, let me just say, I've worked around it so that the drag cancel is much cleaner now, and you get this uh, signal on the specific thing for which drag was canceled, which is super nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, because the other way you have to do it is through notifications, and notifications are app-wide. So you don't get a specific notification that tells you this exact control that was being dragged was canceled. I've worked around that by building this little drag control. And from there, um, I use my drop ship zone. All this is is a control, and all you do is define the size of the drop area, which in this case it's 16 by 16, excuse me. And it's got two of them, data dropped and drop requested. I've hooked up to those manually here. Um, you can do it in the editor if you want, there's not really any issue there. And so when drop is requested, all that means is like the position or the thing in which you're going to drop it has changed. 
Um, so what it does is uh, it says you get this drop request. This drop request has a bunch of specific data in it. So it says can drop. It has the data that your um, drop area actually is looking for as well as the position. And that's all stuff that comes from Godot's uh, drag drop system already. And uh, so what the ship drop zone does, it just says when drop is requested, all you need to do actually is implement something that says whether or not it's allowed to drop. And so you set can drop here from the request if you're allowed to. And if you're allowed to, it'll show the correct stuff in the game and it'll show you uh, the correct stuff when you're you know, trying to edit things. So in my case, all I said was I got the A-star path, I did that through the map. You can add custom data to this. So you'll note when the drag control needs data, I just add my data to this dictionary. It throws it into the data that ends up getting sent to drop requested as well as data dropped I believe and uh, you just get all that data that way much much simpler you don't have to track that through everything there's a preview that you can automatically hook into um, if you look in my player base again just so you know this is all available right now for you if you want to look at it and actually play around with it um, my drag texture is just the texture of whatever sprites involved, and I change that sprite throughout all of the ch all of the children um, playable characters, and so it'll automatically get whatever sprite that is, whatever texture that is, and set it. Um, so that's why you see it. And also in my um, preview, I automatically have it centered with the mouse, which is something that for some reason you normally have to implement yourself. Uh, I still am not entirely sure why that is, um, but this just automatically does it. And so you can put whatever data you want in this, like anything that you're gonna use to validate if this is a droppable thing, put it in there. And you can see I put the whole map in there. That not necessarily, that's not necessarily something that I'd recommend, but um, it's just a dictionary, and so it'll go away eventually scope-wise and get rid of the reference, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so my ship drop zone has access to whatever I've put into it during drop requested. And so in my case, I'm just checking to see if there's already a character there, um, and that gets set in data dropped. So in other words, you can't just overlap characters. And the second thing that I check is um, the number of steps. So each player, or each playable ship, has a distance it's allowed to move. It's unique per ship. Um, I just want to make sure. Am I? Am I still being shown? I'm noticing that I got a uh, an error on my screen, but I. It sounds like people are still able to see what I'm showing, so that's fine by me. Apologies, I got kind of a bizarre setup here. Okay, great. Still there. That's all I care about. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and then, uh, so all it does is check the number of steps taken via that A star path from the two positions. Note the map position is the one that the character starts on. That's set in the data that I originally put in. And the position here is actually just the position of the drop zone that you're in. So it's actually very simple to understand how that works. And you'll note if I go to get a star path here. Hey, expired. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, let me see here. Ground layer. Get a star path. It just converts those values from the local coordinates to the maps coordinates. And that way, um, a star can just do its thing without having to care about anything like that. So that's super nice. And then uh, for the drop area, when data actually gets dropped, you get access to the data and you get access to the position. Now let's see what data is here. We're gonna actually do step print data when data is popped, or uh, drop, excuse me. <laughs> um, let's see here. And I will go ahead and do that. 
let me make sure that's showing again, see if it actually picks up the correct one. Yes, there we go. Okay, now I'll do my drop somewhere. Maybe, maybe not. Oh yeah, it was way over there, that's why. Okay, so I hit drop, and now it's printed it off. So, let me stop this, see what we get. We get the data that we put in. So we have the map position, the map itself, and the player movement. So we didn't get the actual player. So let me do that. Let me go into here and say data player equals self. And that sounds a little bit silly. Again, this is just a data bag, you know, what they call a property bag, essentially, in uh, web development. And it just contains whatever data you need. So what we're going to do now is in the ship drop zone, well, first of all, we're going to do something called implement a move function here, move to. And we're going to say uh, pause, we'll call it vector two. This is going to return void. And for now, we're just going to pass. Um, in fact, we might just print pause. And here, instead of this, um, what we're going to do is we're just going to say, now that uh, we have has character is true, we're just going to say data dot player. And note that because it's a dictionary, this value that you get passed in here, so like, like so, um, when you put things into the dictionary like this, later, you can actually reference them this way, which is super cool, I think. I think that's just a little good old tip. It's nothing to do with plugins or add-ons. Um, we're going to say, uh, not that, we're going to say move to, and we'll say data, uh, let's see here, what do we want? Oh no, we just want position. And then we'll have the player figure out how to do that actual move. We don't have to await this or anything. Um, and one thing that we do need to do is uh, <coughs> when a player moves, let's see here, we need to take them out of the given control. So let's see, how do we want to do that? So when drag is started, so what we need to do is pass self, believe it or not. So move to is going to take the control as well. I don't love that. I'm going to do it for now. Um, and the reason that we do this is so that we can, when we start moving, when we do drag started, or I should say when we um, do, uh, I guess it's drag ended, we're going to keep, keep track of that control throughout this process for where the player is. Um, and so what's going to happen is when the data is dropped, we're going to say this. We're going to say data.player. Dot um, what do I want here? What did I call these? I called this uh, ship drop zone. So ship drop zone dot has, and what did I call this? Has character. So I'm going to refactor this. Has character. Well, let me do this. I'll actually show it this way. Equals false. And the idea there being we just move it basically from uh, out of the, you know, if you're dropping on a new tile, then we're has character false. Um, and then the new one gets set to that, and we get, we reset the uh, ship drop zone inside the player. So we'll take that, go over to the player, say var ship drop zone equals null for now and then yeah um, everything should be good from there we can keep track of all this stuff through this um, and I think everything should work now I'm gonna try something here I don't know if this is actually going to work the way I want it to uh, but let me do this so we've got has character and we have the new rename variable function let's try that and we'll put in just has character because note I didn't really want it to have the underscore because it has to be accessible from other things so like the player might need to access it <coughs> so we got that in the normal places 
yes, and it replaced it throughout the entire thing. <coughs> this is something which is available already um, through, I believe, edit or maybe search and replace. Yeah, so if you hit, um, let's see here, with control R, <coughs> yeah, you can still do things like that and hit tab and hit replace all. Obviously, there's no match here. That's much more powerful than what I did, of course. <coughs> but the fact is, I just like having it available in that option menu. It would be nice, though, to just start using that one to, for renaming stuff because it's, it's so much more powerful um, and it's not overly difficult. It's a little bit hard to like then close that with the keyboard and go back to your code. That's what I like about this is just automatically you're right back into the code. Everything pops up, goes away. You no longer have to care about it. Um, but yeah, now we have uh, that has character, doesn't have the underscore, so it's not considered to be private anymore. And that's kind of, uh, it's not that important, but I like having it. So let's go to move to. Uh, so we go to pl player base and move to now and we refactor this to or not refactor we just add the variable we say drop zone and i forget if i have this named let's see i don't so i'm just gonna ignore the typing on it for now it doesn't really matter for this purpose um we'll leave the print just for the time being but say ship drop zone equals drop zone and you'll notice that i do have the drop zone itself setting these values um, and we know it's a little bit ugly saying go into the player, take its drop zone, say has character equals false. We could do that in move to instead, but I prefer this sort of encapsulation where this value, which exists only in the drop zone, is only changed in the drop zone. Um, that's just what I prefer, so, you know, this is kind of ugly, but it should work fine. Um, so we say that is in the drop zone, and then we just have to move to it. So uh, how do we want to do that? Let's see here. I don't have a physics process. Uh, this is an area, so technically you could move into a, uh, a thing. Um, does it consider quotes? No, it does not at the moment. That's a very good question. Yes, I can do that. Give me a second here. I will... Switch up the music. Anytime you want me to change music, let me know. We got tons of games. Um, yeah, here's something very relaxing. This will put you to sleep if uh, <laughs> if not otherwise. This is from the game Mind the Gap. It was a game that we made about um, putting characters onto a train and trying to fit them on sort of, not exactly um, Tetris style, but sort of similar. Let me know if uh, you can hear this fine now, and uh, we'll go back into this. Um, I just a quick reminder: um, all of the uh, all of the music basically is available through our games. Uh, they're on either my page, Gamma's page, or um, Potato Sack Games page on itch um, sorry I gave it a little nudge case let me know if it's good now um, so yeah let's see where was I I was having it actually move so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say bar current target Uh, vector two dot z actually you know what I'm gonna do now for now. Let's do that. What are you asking about uh Godot engine official? <laughs> mm. Or Natalie as some people know her. <laughs> How I feel. Mm 
Oh, okay. Oh, you mean literally, I right, sorry, I thought you meant how am I doing that specific thing. I was trying to figure out what I was supposed to be answering. Ah, well, I'm doing all right. Um, as you can tell, because I don't talk that much, my voice is a little uh, harsh, but I'm still very happy to go, very uh, excited to be presenting this stuff. A uh, note, this is not the game that uh, officially, if you put uh, if you put in my info here, or if you ask about um, Potato Sack, it does not mention that. Um, let me show you that real quick. So that's the actual game that we are working on uh, at Potato Sack Games. I'm not showing it because while it does have plugins in it, it's primarily not... Um, one that's easy to show, which is, in fact, the Go Firebase plugin. Um, it's easy to show off the code, but the actual functionality is super hard to see. And the reason for that is simply that um, when you have to use Firebase, you have to use private keys and stuff. So I don't have, uh, I don't like showing off my private keys uh, for obvious reasons, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I generally don't. Uh, I will make videos about that, but I generally don't uh, stream development with it. I might do development without showing the results, but I generally don't uh, stream Firebase-related stuff. Um, you can find out a lot about it, though. I have a lot of info about it on my Patreon. Okay, so let's see here. How do we want to do this? Uh, we're implementing move to... We have movement here. Um... We don't need movement actually because we know that the only places it can be dropped. So we have current target position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, first of all, I'm going to actually regionize some of this as I call it. Let me grab ready and pull that down as well. And let me put move to up here so that it's public ish. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab all this. And remember, Alt-R. And I'm just going to say, for this region, um, private handlers etc. I always hit Enter. I don't know why I do that. But now we can just get rid of that. It's kind of ugly for the time being. If we need to look at it later, we'll do that. Um, so what we're going to do here is say current target position oops, equals pause and then we're actually already reopening this so we're going to add physics process and we're going to say something a little bit weird we're going to say if current target position is not equal to null and we're going to hope for the time being. Oh yeah, expired. We've gone over a bunch of stuff that you've probably missed. I'm going to show you some cool stuff if, uh, if you're interested. Um, I've done some really cool things with this plugin. And Alt-R is not one of them. That's just in the engine itself. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited about all this stuff. And... Uh, I can redo one real quick if you're interested. Um, for people who haven't joined, let me show you something that I did with this plugin. And I, if I delete this sprite thing, you'll see obviously there's a bunch of errors here. And so I'll go back and I'll just replace it with uh, this. Oh, cool. Okay. Sounds good, Kiri. I'm loving the Rainbow Chat personally. Um, I don't have it live anymore because my stream, like I said, errored out, errored, errored out on my side. But everyone else, please let me know and let Nat know if she likes the rainbow or if you like the rainbow chat because I definitely do. Um, so, Kiri, check this out. So, you know how sometimes you get caught just putting dollar sign or percent sign something all over your code and it kind of feels bad? Well, my plugin, I've done this. You can hit Alt left quote or tilde on keyboards and you can hit two variable just number two type in a variable name in this case i'll type sprite 
and it recognized it needed on ready and it made the variable and it replaced it everywhere throughout the entire script instantly. I also have this working for functions. Um, if you have like a commonly called function or a, a bunch of code that you call really frequently, you can just select it, replace it with a function and it will replace it everywhere. It doesn't update the parameters, which are, that's one of the things that I want to improve, but um, that's sort of what this uh, stream is about and showing how to make the plugins, which I did a lot of at the beginning. Hello, Enlin, I love that. <laughs> that's a great, uh, great icon there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to just implement my physics process. Uh, I'm going to have the movement speed. I think I'll... Do I want to scale it? I'll just have it be a constant. Um, let me put in... Uh, yeah, now we're getting the really cool people now. Okay, so if the current target is not null, what do we want to do? We want to slowly move towards it. So what I'm going to say, the first thing I'm going to try is I'm going to try global position. I note that we're in a, um, an area, or even just a node 2D, excuse me. So we don't have like the physics things um, normally. I'm doing it in physics process because the child, or the player, excuse me, does have areas in it. So it's a little bit easier to make sure that things are happening in the right place. Um, and we're going to say direction equals, and we're going to say position minus current, oops, yes, target position. We're going to normalize this because vector math, we always got to remember to normalize this value or if they're moving it sideways, they might move too fast or differently. Oh, wow. Thank you, Rothiel. Big, uh, big raider. Big raid. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to say plus equals direction times. I'm just going to say for the time being, I don't know, 30 times delta. And then I'm going to say if global position dot is equal approx current target position then first of all current target position equals null and that should actually just stop us we'll see if that works um, we may go shooting past it but the it should be okay uh, one thing i might do also is put in a um, use a different function slightly to uh, tell if we're where we want to be. Grab some water real quick. Geez, I feel like I should show off the, uh, the refactor again and go over a little bit more of the, uh, the plugin if uh, people want um, from these raiders. Let me know if you want me to go back to talking more about plugins. Um, this is more now about using plugins and uh, it is however you want to pronounce it, rational. However you want to pronounce it. <laughs> You're so funny, Egg. Um, in terms of... Uh, Here's, here's how I think of how to pronounce it. If you've ever been to Pittsburgh, this is a city in the United States. It's a, or actually, no, sorry, this is Philadelphia. Pittsburgh's a different one. Philly, if you've ever been to Philly, maybe not many of you have, but if you have, they have a term. It's called John. It is spelled J-A-W-N. It does not have a definition because it means anything. You can say, like, did you pick up that John the other day like I told you? And in con you have it only has meaning in context. 
you could say like, oh, uh, like when you're trying to say like that person has a nice smile or something, you might say that person has a nice john. And it sounds extremely stupid because how can you even tell what it means? But uh, it's honestly one of my favorite things in all of uh, language is words that don't really have meaning except in context. Um, <laughs> yes, I actually thought of that when it came out and I could not stop laughing. Um, and yes, I did watch it, incidentally. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so let's see here. Let's see if this is going to work. I am uh, not entirely sure, but... Um, That's true, but John feels even more weird in the sense that it uh, feels like it shouldn't exist. <laughs> you should just say whatever you want to say, say what you mean. Uh, let's see if this works. I'm not, uh, and then uh, there is one thing also I forgot I needed to do. Needs data, drag cancel does sprite show. I also need to do... Um, when that value is set, I also need to say data.player. I'm just going to say show sprite. Um, and I'm going to make this a function. Um, I'll actually show how to do the function stuff now. Yep, I was going to say, I think that was just created. Um, so using this plugin again, <laughs> uh, I'll just hit. Uh, Alt that, hit four, and I will name this show sprite. Now I have show sprite. I can put it in the correct region. That's the other thing it doesn't really do is you know look for regions. Um, I will go do that. <laughs> um, don't worry, I have a million puns based on Godot. That's my uh, Firebase team is named the Godonuts. So if you can imagine uh, how many puns that we come up with, we're all sort of like um, we're not necessarily all dads, but we're all dad-like joke makers. Um, so that's where a lot of these puns are going to come from as they come up. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Um, <laughs> that's very funny, rational. Um, so yeah, so this should work now. Um, let's see what happens. Let me just make sure that I did not mess it up. Ah, I did. So I forgot to add that. Whoops. I also forgot to add the actual thing. I also hit the insert button for no reason. Oh no, that's passed in there. Never mind. Perfect. I probably could set that here, but for the time being, I won't do that. All right, I'm just checking in uh, on my screen real quick before I show this. Of course, it's normalized. I have it going backwards because I did it the wrong way. Good. That's what we wanted. Don't forget, people. 
you want the next position minus your position for vectors. Perfect. Okie doke. Um, now let me show this off and uh, bring up the screen again here. Okay, so now all of these characters have the ability to move to new squares. You move left. You should be able to move left. Oh no, that, that row doesn't exist. That's right. Uh, so we're getting this. That's something that I'll update. It's, you can't quite tell, but it's uh, kind of flashing very quickly. Yeah, it looks like if you're going to the side, that happens. If you go straight forward, ends up being fine. And it should work. You should be able to go backwards, too. Yep, so that all works fine. Okay. So, we're getting close to an actual playable game. Let me close this for now. And so next up, what we're going to do is, let's see here, what makes the most sense next? Uh, well, let's fix the shaking, for first of all. Um, so the reason that happens is because in Godot, it uses floats. And floats are sort of never quite equal. Um, you can make them be equal, but what ultimately happens is um, they sort of don't round well. And so when one thing you say is equal a prox to this other position, what ends up happening is it never quite gets exactly there. It kind of overshoots it because of this. And notice we have this 30 here. I'm going to actually do two const here. And I'm going to say ship speed. That gives me the ship speed and const up there. It replaces every 30 throughout my script with that. And that's because I, I like having const instead of uh, naked numbers in there. In case I want to edit it, it's really quick to get up at the top. Um, way easier than having to like open up my region and go find which functions that it are, it's in and stuff. So um, and what it's doing essentially is even though we've got delta, which shrinks it you know, pretty dramatically, um, shrinks the size of this, the step, um, global position never ends up being exactly equal to the target position. It, it overshoots it and then comes back, overshoots it the other way, overshoots it forward um, and it just kind of bounces back and forth really really fast so the way to fix that is actually to use a slightly different function here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say um, or we're gonna say global position dot distance to actually we're gonna use distance squared to only reason for that is a matter of um, efficiency you don't need to use this Make sure, um, if you are going to use it, that you're using it for the right reasons, which is it, if you don't need to get the actual distance, if it just needs to be a value that you're checking against, and it doesn't matter if it's squared or not, distance squared to you is technically faster. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter um, if uh, current target position and we're gonna say if this is less, it doesn't really matter, like, you, I could put that in there just fine. Um, I could make it just distance two and it wouldn't affect anything. I'm gonna say if the distance squared is less than, let's say five for the time being, um, this number might change and I'm just gonna check it to see what it does here initially. I notice I like coding with these constants in the code immediately because I'm, I know where it is and I'm working with it. Um, but then later after, you know, adding new ones, I much prefer having, uh, you know, having those all in their own place. Okay. So five looks like it's pretty good. Um, let me show you all that. 
just to show it's a little bit hard to see because the ships are a little bit small so I apologize about that but now you can see it's not it's not shaking anymore and that number like it'll make things get a little bit off um, and so what we'll do with that to solve that is um, instead of just having checking if it's less than that value um, we will actually say first before setting it to null we'll say global position equals current target position and that way we always know that it's exactly where we were clicked on where we were trying to go now something you don't see this is something I forgot to mention and I, I've been meaning to mention it for this entire time something that you have not seen is how on earth do I have my drop zone placed in the entire game because you don't see them anywhere you don't see this anywhere if I go to my map base you can see enemy starting positions player starting positions drop zones decoration layer that lets me put rocks on the map if I want to do that which is kind of cool um, so I can go like that and put you know rocks out everywhere um, but drop zones is actually a scene collection and this is another thing that a lot of people don't know about I thought I'd explain it today um, a scene collection is different from your normal collections that you get in your tile sets um, normally if you remember you get an atlas collection or a, sorry an atlas source and the atlas source takes a picture and it's for repeating pictures wherever you want I have that for example for the ground layer these are atlas sources and they just have one picture each I've got the rock here I don't need it but I do have it um, I was thinking about putting it around the outside maybe but for these it's exactly what you'd expect you'd have um, you know different uh, collision shapes different navigation I actually have navigation defined on this even though I'm not using it technically um, I had started off this project using it and it actually didn't work um, so in my case um, I have that for this but for and for decoration layer incidentally but for drop zones enemy starting positions and player starting positions I do not and the reason is they're all scene source or scene collection sources these allow you to put any scenes you want into a tile map or in this case tile map layer which is extremely nice you can see I don't have placeholders on it's a little bit cramped but if I turn on placeholders you can see where all my drop zones are and you actually can see where my enemy starting positions are a little bit um, those use a uh, a uh, what do you call it um, a marker 2d as my possible starting positions as do my player starting positions and so you can see the actual node in there the reason you can't see it with drop zones is because as mentioned it's just a control it doesn't really it doesn't have a visual it doesn't need one if I decided that I wanted one I could put that in and that would be just fine so I'll leave the uh, you know the uh, what do you call it here on just for the purposes of uh, the placeholders just for the purposes of being able to see something but yeah all I have is a big rectangle made of these ship drop zones and all you do is you add scenes collection here that's how you add it and then it will give this to you empty and you can just go drag your scenes over into it it's really very straightforward and then uh, you can select which scene you want to add in the actual tile map it just shows up here exactly the same way as your tiles do and you can just throw them in there it's uh, it's basically my favorite new thing from Godot 4 and I'm really appreciative of Groob for having implemented that I actually don't know if that's how he pronounces his name I hope so uh, might be Groud might be something else um, but what I do know is like the new tile maps were incredibly powerful and he continues to improve this system a lot I had made a proposal for the, these layers in the past and he finally had time to implement them and they're absolutely beautiful 
they work so well. I love them. There's still a few bugs. We're obviously in the beta, um, but make sure you check them out if you haven't already. Tile maps, the actual node, are kind of old now. Not that useful in my mind. Um, okay, so let's go back to some code here. So now you see that where my drop zones actually come from. And we've got now the position actually functioning here where um, things are moving. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'm going to do now is actually implement movement for my enemies, which I don't have yet. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, movement for enemies is a little bit weirder. It's fundamentally the same thing, moving on the squares. I'm also going to use the, uh, the ground layer like, the, like I did for um, you know, dragging and being able to tell. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to have enemies have to select who they want to attack, basically the closest player in this case, and they're going to try to move as close as they can to that player so that they can attack them. And this game, what you saw is sort of real-time strategy. It's not exactly. It's closer to like a cross between a turn-based and real-time strategy. The idea being, I'm going to make a delay after every ship you move so that you can't move it again within that delay. Um, as for uh, everything else, uh, what you're going to do, or what it will do is, the enemy ships will also be delayed. Yes, this is GD script. Um, everything in this particular one is all GD script. Uh, I don't have any uh, plugins that are C sharp based, despite being a uh, C sharp developer. And the reason for that, uh, or previously being a C sharp developer, and the reason for that is simply because um, I have just taken GD script and, and ap appropriated it. I made it my own thing. Um, also, just so anyone, if anyone's curious, uh, you'll see this special effects dot shake um, in places. And all that is, is I made a uh, library in my toolkit that handles a bunch of kind of standard uh, types of um, special effects. And so like there's a damage one that can do like the damage flash. There's explosions, which will play an explosion uh, animation. There's hit stop, if you're familiar with that. That's a nice one to have. Uh, you can do all these in parallel or in series. There's particles that can be shown on the screen and go away when they're actually completely freed when you uh, get them. There's different types of hits, hit effects, shader swaps, um, shake. Uh, so what are you referring when you say those, chairman of gaming? my special animation or my special effects here yeah some of them are um they're typically more like tweens like you might see here so as this stretches whatever you've got and uh makes it look like it's pulled apart briefly um and then it goes back to the original scale um idea being like uh I do this for like making something look like it's shaking in some cases. Like if you want a, a shake that looks like it's expanding and collapsing very quickly. Um, not all of them are like that though. For example, I've got a particles effect. You just define a particles, set it, and it'll automatically run. If it's a one shot, when it's done running, it'll delete it from the tree automatically. That's okay. I'm happy to answer basic questions chairman. Um, these aren't really part of the presentation that I'm intending today, but I'm absolutely happy to talk about them. Anything that you want to see in this project, the project is available if you want to download it and start playing with it yourself. Um, there's a ton of stuff that I've built for this um, automatic like debug screen where you output stuff, all that type of stuff. So drag drop is in this particular repo. It's not in my uh, main repo for the toolkit, but I do plan to add it there. And this drag drop, which I, I don't know if you were here for it, Chairman, to see it, but the implementation of it is way, way simpler than Godot's drag and drop. Um, so I highly recommend using it. It's completely free now. Um, I've also got this free awaitable in here, which it'll just wait 
for any signal you give it. And this frees the class that was passed in. So if you've got like, um, uh, for example, well, like a particles effect and you want to get rid of it as soon as it's done running, well, you'd pass it in as the target, you'd pass in that signal off of it. And as soon as it's done running, it'll free itself, which is super nice. Um, and that's the type of thing that I like to focus on is tools. These are all tools which are meant to help people um, make their games much cleaner and do the things that they want. One of the things you see often is people want nodes to just be able to free themselves for any signal. You get that with timers because they already exist. You know, if you go like get tree, create timer, and say like four seconds, and then you say timeout, and you so let's say you await that. Believe it or not, this creates a node internally. I can't await here because, or I can't get tree because this is in ref counted, but this is the concept. Um, this creates an actual node in the scene tree that runs, and then as soon as it's timeout is called, it's killed off. Um, this mimics that functionality. Same thing happens with tweens. Um, like those happen automatically. This lets you have it for any any node you want. And because it's ref counted, it doesn't actually need access to the tree. It just needs access to the target as well as the signal that you want to listen to, which can be any signal. It doesn't even have to be on the target itself. Um, okay, so that's just a little bit of an aside um, for the game that I'm implementing itself. Um, we probably will be using free awaitable for hit signals. And part of the reason is, um, let me see if I have it in here. I'm not actually sure if I have it in this one. I'll have to go add it. That's okay. Um, once I've added this new effect that I've got, I've already got it and I think it's published somewhere already. But uh, basically what it does is it allows you to listen to multiple signals at the same time. So you can say like, whichever one fires first, respond to that one, don't respond to any of the others. So you can await multiple signals, which is a big problem in Godot, I think. You can't do that right now. I have it so you can. Um, and I'll show that in a little bit. I'll add it to this, uh, to this repository and, or do I have it? No, I don't have it. Um, yeah, so I'll do that in a bit. Um, when, when the thing comes up. So that was just about the special effects. You just pass in, uh, in this case for shake, that's a spe uh, specific function that I made because it's so common. I just passed in the sprite and that uses um, Kids Can Code's implementation of shake with a fix that I've implemented uh, because the way that it works, if you put in too big a value, it <clears throat> can blow out the size of ran of uh, integer for um, something that he's doing within the uh, indexing into a, uh, a noise texture. Regardless, it's not really that important. It just, well, I just wanted to make sure that people knew that, you know, this library contains op other open source stuff from other developers that I find to be pretty helpful. So we don't need to print this out anymore, I just realized. Um, I'll get back into the game itself here. So what do we want to do? We wanted to work on Two main things for me I can think of right now, which is um, primarily uh, enemy movement, getting that working, making sure that it works the way that I want it to, almost or basically exactly the same way as um, the players do, except without dragging and dropping, of course, and then uh, I think we just go on to attacking and possibly, uh, you know, start building out the UI, I think. Um, if that's something that people are interested in, uh, I'm happy to, you know, keep doing that. Um, for the, uh, if, if you'd rather see more about how to build plugins and stuff, I can do that. I can even, I, I've considered trying to build a, a plugin live, but uh, I sort of don't want to um, because, there's a lot to it. Um, so like one of the things that you will always see me do is bring up 
the search help, type in plugin, and just start reading. And I feel like for actual streaming, that's sort of boring because I'm looking for everything here. <laughs> everything you can imagine. Um, I am happy to talk more about them if people missed my discussion earlier also. Um, the one thing that I was considering was adding um, my drag control and my uh, drop control or drop area, I'm calling it, uh, to a plugin. Just make an actual plugin that houses them. And then uh, I think I might actually do that. It, it's not difficult at all to do that. Um, so. Yeah, let me do that. I'll show you how I create a plugin, and I'll just make a new one here. Uh, if you go to project settings, um, you should all be able to see this. Uh, if you go to over to plugins, hit create new plugin. We'll name this. Uh, it says plugin name. We'll name it. Um, what do we want to name this? That's always the hardest part of these things is coming up with good names. We'll name it um, replacement drag. How about? matter what the plugin is named. We'll hit activate now. Um, we actually probably shouldn't have hit activate now. That's fine. And what I'm going to do is now uh, I'm going to move this entire thing pretty much into, ow, just hit my elbow. Good. That's what we wanted. Into replacement drag. Now you'll note it uh, messed up all the scenes, so we're going to change these. We're going to say res add-ons, replacement drag, drag drop. This is not what I was looking for. Hang on. <laughs> okay, from there it's the same. So we go add-ons, replacement, drag, drag drop, drag preview. Okay, there we go. And that's just in my drag control. It's something that if you wanted to update, by the way, you couldn't just change the texture. Um, technically, you could set the texture to a viewport texture and put in something significantly more complicated. So for example, if you had uh, a base viewport texture that shows a stack of cards. Uh, I do have a Twitch channel 12 feet up. It's uh, it's under the name back at 50 feet. Um, I haven't streamed there for a while. Uh, I am planning to kind of reboot my my channel, not necessarily reboot it, but start streaming again. I more typically have streamed in the past on, uh, on um, what do you call it, um, YouTube. But um, mostly lately I've been super busy with work, uh, work at Ramatak and work on my Firebase plugin, which uh, recently we had a, a big team member change where mostly, unfortunately, almost everyone dropped, um, or I dropped everyone on purpose because I just hadn't been hearing back from them. So in the long run, I uh, reduced it down to just the, the uh, test maintainer and myself, and um, we, uh, we pretty much handle everything in good old Firebase now. So I want to do a big, big refactor of it in order to uh, make future development easier. And so just went through that. If you've ever used the Godot Firebase GD script based plugin in the past uh, and you're thinking about trying it again, I'll just tell you it has dramatically changed from what it used to be. It was, uh, I appreciate it 12 feet. That, that means a lot to me. And I definitely will start streaming again. Um, I don't know what time you're usually available. I probably will be streaming in pretty early mornings and sometimes later at night. 
definitely sometimes on weekends um, yeah and usually it's gonna be uh, uh, possibly jam game develop uh, game jam development um, but often it's gonna be controls and stuff like that different things that I've found that are really useful I have like a for example a circular container that uh, is a UI control it's not in this project for any reason but uh, it displays whatever you put into it whatever controls you put into it in a circular pattern instead of what we have now which is just vertical or horizontal or a grid um, so yeah I, I do a lot of cool things on streams typically and some people find them boring but I'm hoping uh, that I can do a little bit more than that in the future and make uh, some exciting stuff especially stream some of my jam game development because uh, my team basically does get a wild jam which shout out to Katie from get a wild jam uh, she goes by bacon shake uh, you might know her but she is an absolutely fantastic jam host absolutely growing uh, wild jam beyond reason I think uh, it is an absolutely massive jam now and uh, really, really fun times developing for that jam. And I do it a lot. I, I, love, I love making jam games. My entire original team for jam games uh, is now a professional development team. And that's what we're making if you look in uh, dollar sign Potato Sack. It sounds weird, but the name of the company is Potato Sack Games. So... Uh, feel free to check it out. I love that game, and that's what we're working on. It's a super, super fun game to play. I'm going to blow my nose here real quick. It's going to be changing quite a bit from that for the, uh, the professional version or the uh, publishable version. But, uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's one of the best games we've ever made, and I, I think we took fourth or fifth, maybe, something like that, seventh, I don't know, somewhere around there. Um, and it was a blast to make. It was a blast to play. We were all, like, big, uh, you know, nerdy uh, roguelike players and stuff like that. So, as you can see, Kaishido here is, uh, he's the art director for that game. So, if you want to, you know stand there and look or sit there and look at the the game's art because it's so beautiful that's all kaishido he is an absolute master of, of art and he uh he, he he makes it so fast i just don't understand like i can do art but it's so slow <laughs> in any case uh enough about that um i think i'm gonna update the music real quick because this is starting to get a little bit closer to lunch and I think I want something a little bit faster a little bit more aggressive so um, let's see here what do we want let me ask my team whoever's there still you want MacGyver you want Panslaughter or Impish Winds they're all so good I'm thinking probably MacGyver because it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more my speed. I think. Panslaughter, really good though. As is Impish Winds. I have Dread Gamble up also, but it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, that think I'm thinking that's right. And Case here is my team's uh, music director, so he handles everything he also streams himself if you want to go check out his stream he's uh he's a pretty pretty good streamer does a lot of uh a lot of game streaming and stuff like that all right i'm gonna do mcgyver i think that's what i'm feeling like right now takes a little bit of time to get into it i'm gonna just let it run and uh case can you let me know how the sound is so i think this one was tuned a little bit higher than the rest
or anybody, let me know. Is this if this is too loud? Let me know. I'm happy to tune it down a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, well, for the time being, I'm gonna um, go back to actually implementing the game using the plugin. Um, if you have any questions about the plugin, specifically how it works, happy to answer them. Um, if there's, uh, I can actually show real code from it too. That's something that I didn't do. Um, so let me actually jump over there real quick and show kind of how that happens. Since I'm in the point of a little bit of a transition, implementing enemy movement, it makes sense to come back to Script Factor itself and show how some of this stuff works. Um, so the actual editor itself, the um, interface that you see here, it's dirt simple. It's just this file. There's really nothing to it aside from getting the pop-up to show. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> well, it is, a, it is a work of art, my friend. It is absolutely my favorite song still that you've ever made, that I know of, anyway. I'm actually gonna tune it down just a tad because it's slightly interfering with my thinking. Okay. So really very little is done here. What ends up happening is I get the editor that previously was added, if you remember, in my actual thing here. And I'm remember, I'm also building that drag plugin. I gotta remember that. Um, but all the editors are just these things. And so if you go to my validators, all it does is checks, in this case, the name one. And Godot already has this built in. It just checks to see if it's a valid identifier. So I just use that and no validator. You could put in way more complicated things if you needed to, but why when Godot already supports it? And then no validation is just the none. That's for... Um, regions also which it doesn't matter what you put into that region value which it does it um, and so that's I mean that's exactly what it's doing it just gets the position that was passed in um, it gets the uh, code editor and it shows it the position here is uh, it's meant to be the mouse position but I made this work a little bit differently so that it uh, should be relatively close to the middle of the screen. Um, okay, so... Oh, I didn't get to show the uh, the actual replacers. The replacers, those are the comp... That's where all the logic is done, honestly. Let me find it here. And so we're going to need probably some kind of similar code to this with... Um, with the drag plugin, possibly. We have to think about it. I'll have to think about it. Maybe I'm misspeaking. But um, in large part, I think it's going to be a lot simpler than this. So a replacer, all it does is it takes any code edit. Code edit's the, the actual type that you see here. This is a code edit, for example. And it replaces what value for this other value. And that's just generic. That works more or less for anything. Um, it's like, take this selection, in this case, and replace it with other stuff. As you can see, my variable one, here's my on ready checks. Very simple approach. I just take a template that includes these values, <coughs> and these are just my own definitions. This is all just string replacement. <coughs> and so I take, like, the variable value, so that's the like the actual name that you get up top. And in my template, I replace the value here, the part that's on the right side of it, with whatever the context is. So that's the, the context is the thing which was selected. <coughs> <coughs> and after that, I replace the name value with whatever name the person put in. And so what I end up doing is I take, 
I go to the top of the file, I take the zeroth index or the zeroth line. <coughs> Excuse me, gotta grab some more water here. And I just blanket replace the entire set of text in the editor that exists where it looks like context with the name that was previously chosen. And that's how it puts in all those variables really, really fast. Then, so in that moment, it's not a well-defined script, but it's so fast, you don't even notice. You don't get that error because it takes a couple seconds for it to register. So then I just start looping over the top, the lines at the top of the script and say, if I find one that's not empty, or basically while it's not empty, I add one to it. I then make sure that on ready is applied appropriately. The context, in other words, if it has a dollar sign or a percent sign, I set on ready, has on ready to true. I prepend it to the variable value. I add a new line before the variable value that is now includes the on ready. And then code editor just has an insert line at. And so I just insert that new line that I've made at the index that I've made or that I have. And because I've put this before it, it automatically inserts it wherever that is with a new line. And it's, that's pretty much all everything here is, including the const replacer. Um, you'll note the const replacer is a little bit different. It has to check the on ready checks first because you cannot have an on ready constant value. It, the, the concept should not exist and does not exist. And the reason is, if it's on ready, it's being applied, the value is being applied only after ready is happening. And so, how could it be const? Like, you can't set something. On ready is not instantaneous, and that's all a const value can be. So that works exactly the same way, though. That, that's all the same code. In fact, I probably could replace this all with another function, except for the on ready part because that is handled differently. And so I might actually try to do that. We'll see. Um, the function replacer, like I have a different, you know, template, but in large part, it's all exactly the same. The one thing that's a little bit broken is um, indentation. Um, it feels like something is weird about that. Um, right now that's not quite working uh, but what ends up happening is it takes the first line that is selected so this and there is a get indent level and what I'm thinking is it must be either it's broken or repeating um, for whatever that number is is not how to do it um, I'm not sure why that seems to not work. It might be a bug in Godot itself, honestly. It might not be, I don't know. But ultimately, everything else is exactly the same. You get the template, you replace the name of it with the name that you've selected. So that's a little bit different because the name, remember, is, here's the template, uh, a little bit different. And then the function call itself has its own template. So we hit that here. We just replace all the functions. Yeah, func call template, there it is. Um, we set the indentation level again, and then we replace everywhere where it finds context, in other words, everywhere where it finds the function that was selected, and replaces it with the function call value. Then I made the decision to take and go to the end of the editor and just insert at that last line a new line and then the function value itself and the reason I did that is for the simple reason that um, if uh, it makes no almost nobody puts all of their new functions at the top of the editor they tend to put it somewhere in the middle but I don't really have a logical way to say, let me go do that. Like, let me find where to put this. I could try to take the current function and like, or the current selection and 
search for like the next highest or the next lowest function, it's a bit of a hassle and would be a lot easier in the C++. So that will hopefully be there for any type of code that I'm able to write. Um, but in this case, I'm just picking the bottom of the file, add it, let them put it where they want it, let them add the parameters that they want, that type of thing. And rename is actually even simpler than anything else. It's just a, a replace. Um, and as you can see for region, uh, I actually have a, a slight difference with how I make my regions. And that's because as a C-sharp developer, regions function a little bit differently. And uh, what ends up happening is if you've not selected anything, you make them my way. And that's where I know that regionize is a useful function is when you don't have anything selected, you just want it to make a region, you can do that. Um, but with the Godot's code editor, it has a built-in create code region and it does the text selection for you so you can add it. But what it doesn't do, which is the thing that I want to do, is adds um, the C-sharp sort of um, template concept which is uh, it has the value at the end so if you look if I do this oh I don't have region never mind um, I can just do I'll select nothing here select a space <laughs> in C sharp typically you would also have this value down here and the reason is uh, usually if you're looking at a bunch of nested regions, you want to know what this end region is ending. So I have it doing that automatically when I have region in there. I don't have it now because I realized you could do it uh, in the engine itself. Okay, so that's more of the actual code involved. And this is for code editing. So this is very different from a lot of stuff you're going to get. In normal things, like for example, well, it's probably not going to come up in the drag one either, but um, what often happens is you'll need to add nodes to the scene tree itself. Like if you turn on your thing, you might want to add, like um, maybe you'll add a, a node to uh, something automatically. Um, or if you invoke your, uh, your plugin, maybe it automatically adds a bunch of nodes into your scene. And when you do that, one thing you got to be really careful about, um, just keep this in mind, is make sure you set the owner on those nodes. If you do not set the owner and you don't set it to the correct node, it the editor can't track changes that have happened on that node or with that node. And so when you close the scene, it won't keep that node available in the scene. I think you'll see it be updated dynamically in the scene tree, but it won't actually keep it after you close it and reopen it. Um, and if you want it to stick around, then you would want to do that. Note also that's true if you remember at the very beginning I mentioned script uh, editor scripts. Those are the once-offs that you can just run and you just do this. You hit editor script here. Um, if you do this, you also have to set the node if you're going to update what the nodes are in the scene tree. So make sure, be very careful to do that. Um, it's a pretty common bug that you'll run into and people will get very frustrated with it. It is in the documentation, so hopefully, you know, if you find it there, you can... Uh, use that so okay so next up I'm just gonna add my drag and drop now um, and you'll see what I'm doing again I just go to the editor plugin and look through some of this stuff I think what we're gonna want here is um, probably some sort of add node so it looks like add custom type maybe Oh, interesting. I didn't even know this existed. Add undo, redo, inspector, hook, callback. So you can actually add callbacks for that and change what happens with undo, redo, or listen for when undo, redo happens. 
Um, that is super cool. Um, in any case, let me um, let me continue with this. You can see how many things there are. This is just incredible. And so I was suggesting probably, yeah, add custom types seems like the right thing. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna copy this, come over to my plugin, where'd I put it? Plugin.cfg, no, that's not it. This is, let's see here. Plugin.gd, there we go. And I'm just gonna paste this up above because that's what we're gonna need to do. So what we want, Here's kind of the weird thing, okay? With add custom type, you'll note, you can only add it by string, by the base of the string, and the script. And that's kind of bizarre. Like, that doesn't seem useful. This is the script that gets applied to it, and you can also add the icon, of course, here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start typing and see what makes sense for this. So if I want to add a custom, that's not how that's written, type, and I got to name the type. So what do I want to name it? Let's go with drag control. The base, now this, it doesn't tell you this, but this is the base type. And I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, let me just double check something here. I'm pretty sure you can actually put in the path to the actual base, which in this case would be drag control. So let me try that. Let me see what happens if I do that. Okay, well, it's time to close everything except for this, close other tabs. <laughs> um, and let me bring up, oh no, that's fine. Um, and what I'll do is I'll try this. This may not work. If, that's, if this doesn't work, that's perfectly fine. Like a lot of uh, this type of development is very, um, you know, it's, it's based on um, trial and error let's say. So I'm going to try this. Res colon colon slash slash add-ons replacement drag drag drop drag control dot gd. Now I'm not sure if that's right. In fact it seems like it's probably not. I'm probably gonna have to do something else here and that's okay. But then what we need to do is actually preload this. And little known fact, you can just preload scripts directly. I will put in the icon. I'm going to put null for now. Um, it's probably going to complain about that. I'll figure out an icon later. Um, and you know, whatever it is, it should be fine. But you usually can put null for, for these things. Um, and we'll see if that is the case here. Um, the second thing I got to add, and I'm just going to copy paste, is the drop control. It's actually called drop area. And that will be very similar. It's the exact same thing except this will say drop area. And this will as well. And so one thing I'm gonna do here, I'm actually gonna do this by hand. I'm just gonna say um, path equals The reason I'm not using my um, uh, 
plugin for this is because, as was asked earlier, it doesn't recognize uh, quotes, so I don't want to mess that up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete all this. I just say script path oops, plus that. Same thing here. There's probably better ways to do this, but for the purposes of just getting it done, this is easy enough. things about drop area you'll notice about this um, actual thing here is the only thing that is really set on it is this custom minimum size so if we need to set that in here or if our users need to set that they'll be able to do it because it'll have a control hopefully in there and then they can set that custom minimum size this is really good for like card games by the way it's not something that I've implemented with it, but if you look at the dice, for example, in um, Snake Eye Saga, you can see we haven't published the code, but that is the code which, professionally speaking, uses my drag drop code. And so I knew it was valuable. I knew it was completely separate from the game, so I pulled it out and I put it into its own little, uh, little thing. You can find a write-up about it, by the way, on my Patreon. It is paid, but uh, I figure it's also free now. Like, you can see all the code for free in the game that I'm developing here. So if you want to use that, that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so let me see here. So I'm trying this drop area. If that doesn't work, I'll go back to just control. And I'll, I'll have to set some things manually, but uh, neither of these things are more than that, really. If you look at the drag control, it's also just a control. It doesn't have any children. Drop area doesn't have any children. Drag preview technically does, but it is dynamically loaded in drag control here in the script, so I don't need to do anything with that. Um, so it seems like this plugin is pretty close to done, actually. One thing you remember, need to remember, though, is clean up of the plugin. So what we're going to say is remove custom type and drag control, as well as drop area. And I actually think that might be it. Um, I'm going to go in, just for the sake of testing, and delete this drop area. Notice everything is hooked up to it manually, so I don't really care about what's happening. And you've got to remember to turn it on, so I'm going to do that real quick. And what that does is, now if I go to add child, note I'm not going to instantiate child scene. If I go to add child, and I say drop, it has drop area in it. Interestingly, I don't see... Oh, it's because it says drag, that's why. So let me try adding this. See what happens. Well, we've got the script. That's the script we want. For this purposes, we can set our minimum size again, 16 by 16. We'll replace that. It needs to have stop for mouse, which is a common thing that you'll see people switching automatically to pass or ignore. It actually needs that for this, so I'll keep it. Um, let me just see if this works. I'm extremely happy if this just works. I'm going to show it too so you can see it. Looks like it does. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all this functionality. Now, it looks like my drop went to a little bit of a weird spot. Not sure why it's doing that, but note, I can't drop it on there, which is kind of cool. Um, this must have to do with um, placement of um, 
the ultimate end position. But I'll, I'll see about fixing that. There must have been some kind of change that I made. Uh, but yeah, so that's still working. So now we have these things set up as a, a full plugin. And so I can go into my player base. I'm like, I have all these things connected. Um, so what I'm gonna do actually is just go into ready and make a ready function if it doesn't exist. Now it does, so I'll leave drag control there and I'll just connect to these manually. Oops, drag dot, drag cancel dot connect on drag control, drag cancel. Now note the autocomplete for Godot is actually not that smart yet. Um, it will put in the full function name if you just hit enter there. Started dot connect on drag, oops. Drag started, so you have to delete those two and then add another one, a little bit ugly. Um, drag dot needs data on drag control needs data. Okay, now let's just say I delete this. And instead I say add child control, type in drag, we got drag control. It has those automatically, you can see it over here in the inspector. Now our thing, because it hooked up manually, it doesn't care. Uh, for this, we're gonna do the same thing with custom minimum size of 16 and replace that. Now let's see what happens. Ah, that's right. One thing I just remembered I forgot is that's why the drop area is not working the way I wanted. Okay. Yes, um, so basically the way this is laying out, it automatically puts it here and where I actually want it is centered. So I'm gonna do that. And in fact, I'm doing that with that. Um, note that your drop area will want this to be the entire size of the drop area. Another thing you're very likely to want is a texture in here to show like this is a valid drop area one thing that is very cool is if um, if you want to like turn it on dynamically in your thing which connects to the drop area, you can just in request drop requested. Excuse me, if it's a valid drop, if can drop is true, maybe you want to like fade in the scene or the uh, texture. Excuse me, that looks like it's supposed to be available for drop. That's something that I did with um, a few different things already with this. And it's super pretty. I, I absolutely love it. And then when you say can, can't drop, like when can drop is false, or after the data is dropped, you maybe fade it out. And that makes it so that when you actually drop the thing, it goes away. Um, I might add that here in a bit. I, I don't have anything to look like a drop zone right now, but maybe I'll just make like a quick, um, you know, like semi-transparent or make a fully transparent, uh, or not transparent, but fully um, opaque um, thing that like shows a little outline maybe, something like that. And I'll show you how to do that here shortly. Um, but now we just made a control. We just made a completely valid thing. The one thing that is missing, again, is um, the actual position of this. You'll note that the actual player exists centered. I have it on centered in the uh, on the sprite here. So the drag control should connect there. So I just have to manually move this, um, which is fine. Um, I think people will be used to that. It's not an uncommon thing to have to do. So now let's see what happens when I hit play again show this. This should be much better. Yes. Perfect.
Okay, and that lets you move your characters into place, and eventually you get to fight against your opponent's stuff. Uh, one thing that I want to do is make it rotate towards whatever the direction of movement is. I'm not going to do that just yet. Okay. I think I'll keep going here for another half hour. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, make sure to ask you know, all your questions uh, when you need to here. Oh, thank you, Rafa. That's really nice. I am probably going to uh, drop in about 30 minutes, maybe maybe a little bit longer. I could probably go another hour and a half. Um, I normally have to eat lunch at a specific time, but I, I'm feeling a bit better today. So I'll keep going with this. And um, for everybody who's rating, I know there's a ton of you. That's really appreciated, really awesome. Um, in fact, I had not followed Rafa. I didn't realize that. So I've done that now. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, um, actually, I hope I didn't just follow for Godot. I meant to follow for myself. We'll see if that's what happened. Um, I think I did. But um, in any case, uh, we're talking today about making plugins in Godot and how simple it is. I just whipped one up from something that already existed in the code base that you can find at... Uh, what is it? It is hashtag project, I think. Yeah, script factor is the, the project. Um, so I said hashtag, I meant exclamation point. Yeah, and uh, one of the nice things about this uh, plugin that I've made for this is that it can replace things in the code editor very, very quickly, much faster than what you normally would encounter, like if you're trying to refactor a bunch of stuff. So as an example, let me show you this example. Now that I've got a bunch of these, I'm gonna copy this drag control. And for all the new people, you know how sometimes when, uh, when you're writing up a script, sometimes you just wanna write fast. And sometimes you do something like this, where you just put drag control all over the place. And then later you're like, okay, let me uh, go back and refactor. I'll cut this. I'll go up. I'll add my thing up here at on ready bar drag equals that. And I'll come down and I'll add drag down here. I We do this all the time because you want to make stuff fast. You know, it's easy to copy paste. You can get it, you know, reasonably quickly. Um, what I've done is I've turned that into a plugin that does all code editing for you or refactoring a lot of it. It doesn't do all of it, but it does a lot of it. And a lot of the stuff that you really need, so for example, renaming variables instantly, making a variable out of something instant, making something a constant instant, make something a function. You can refactor to functions. If you find a lot of copy pasted data to function, you just hit the number, you hit alt plus its left quote or tilde, and then hit the number next to it. You can also technically click. I think I found a glitch with clicking or using uh, up down arrows. But if you hit the number, it definitely always works. So I'll hit two variable and you'll see there's a little little thing here. It says two variable. So I type in drag and now I have my variable. It's replaced all throughout the code. As you can see, everything's exactly the same as I had it before you joined. So it's super nice. Um, it automatically puts variables at the top, uh, which is where most people store their variables. And yeah, if it's uh, something you're interested in, it already exists there. I'll be adding it to the asset lib possibly um, in the future. Um, right now it's very beta, very, um, a lot of things are broken with it and I, I would like to add it, but ultimately I would like this to be added to the engine itself. And so I'm planning to open a pull request, uh, once I've looked to see if there's a, um, 
a request already for it. Um, not a pull request, but a uh, a uh, suggestion or what? What are they called? I'm forgetting now. The uh, request that you get in in uh, GNOME's thing itself. The um, you know request for updating code and changing things and adding things and stuff. A proposal. That's it. Sorry, I'm losing my mind here. Um, so that already is something I've shown a lot. Uh, so I'm not going to show too much of it again. But uh, let's continue with the actual game dev and, and see what uh, what people think. I just made a new plugin for these drag control and uh, drop areas. They're called. Um, you can see the drop area here, and it was it took me seconds to make the whole control to make. I said sorry to make the whole. Um, Plugin. This is all the plugin ended up being. My plugin much more complicated. The the script looks wildly different. But if you're just adding nodes that show up when you hit add child node, really really simple. Or if you want to add, um, you know, like a uh, a singleton, dirt simple. It's so so easy. And if you go here, oops, that's not what I wanted. If you go to uh, editor plugin, if you just hold down control and click editor plugin, <coughs> you can see all the crazy things that you can add. <coughs> you can add 3D gizmos, inspector plugins, which manipulate this stuff, um, export, import plugins, <coughs> you can add things to containers, you can add things to docs. I use add auto load singleton in my Firebase uh, plugin. That's one you have to be a little bit careful with because there was, I don't know if there still is, but there was a bug where it reordered um, the singleton sometimes. So if you are if you want to just add a singleton to, to a project and have a thing that does that. So Firebase makes sense because you just access it through Firebase dot, say, real-time database dot whatever. Um, other things you might have... Um, a global state manager, for example, that you want to be able to add to any project you build. And uh, you might want to add it as a singleton to every project you build. And if you do that, you can just make a plugin for it. And no, you don't have to publish your plugins. Like, this plugin technically is not published in the asset library. So just build these things to make them useful for yourself. Like, that's what I encourage. And you can edit basically anything on the screen. I mentioned this very early on in the stream, but virtually anything goes. Um, Godot is just so powerful, and the editor itself is made with Godot, so you get tons and tons of functionality that you just add and are able to make creating your games a lot easier. So I definitely think everybody should look into it and, and kind of... Uh, I've been looking into debugger plugins so that I can make custom debug points, for example. This is a good example where you can set a condition on the debug point. Have you ever, how often have you written code where you've got like, well, I want to put a condition on this so that it only applies, you know, I might say if um, X, Y, Z print XYZ and I might have I might gate it this way I might say print XYZ normally without that and put a thing here but I may not always want to do this for every time I'm calling take damage I might not want to hit this particular thing and it's a very common thing to have in the editor in any editor um, for some reason Godot doesn't have it I want to add it to the right click thing but Right clicks are pretty difficult to add, as it turns out. So um, I might make a new gutter, actually, and just have that be conditional ones that function completely uh, differently. And I might make a, uh, you know, like a custom breakpoint that just prints off whatever you tell it to at that point. And then you don't even have to put in a print statement. Like, there's a lot of uh, cool ideas with custom debuggers and debugging stuff so we'll see if I'm able to do that that's way down the line way 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 down the line um, 
yeah, much more immediate is just trying to get, in this case, uh, this, this game more or less fully working. So what I'm going to do is, uh, next up, we talked about this a while ago, I think I'm going to get enemies moving. And since it's mostly live, or like pseudo live, with a countdown timer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give every enemy a countdown timer equal to... In fact, I'll give every player and enemy the same countdown timer, and I'll make it probably... Maybe around two seconds or three seconds, which sounds like a lot, but with the speed this game is being intended to be played, it's actually not that much. Um, so... Let's see how we do that. So first with the player. We'll actually add it with the player first. I see no problem adding it there. I'm just gonna put it on a timer. And I like to, there's not necessarily any good reason for this, but I like putting my drag controls, uh, or my, um, excuse me, my control controls toward the bottom every time. We're gonna be adding some UI here in a bit as well, including like a uh, texture for progress uh, that Kaishido made. But for this timer, we're just gonna say uh, move timeout. And we're gonna give it uh, wait time at the moment of three, just for the sake of argument, and we're gonna call it one shot. One shot just means it only fires once, obviously, maybe. <laughs> we're gonna go here. We're gonna go to this node here, move timeout. We're gonna connect a timeout there. And the, the connection needs to be not one shot. It just needs to only fire once. And I'll get into why that is shortly. Because it's one of these, I'm gonna move the region down below. It's a handler or um, a function handler is what I call them, or event handler. Um, and what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a can move here. We're gonna add var can move. It's gonna start off as true. And for the move timeout, as soon as this starts, uh, this is when it ends, mind you. Timeout is when it ends. So wherever we have it that it starts, we're going to do something. And where that starts is, remember, it will be when it's actually dropped. So what we're going to do is uh, move two. If we go up to move two, that's when it's actually dropped. So we're gonna say move timeout dot start. And we can use this. Now you see time sec says minus one. That's what we want. That is effectively means it's just gonna restart from the very beginning. We don't need to worry about if it's in the middle of a thing, it'll just go back to the beginning. And what we do is we say can move equals false. Now, here's something that's cool for drag started or can drag in, or can drop, excuse me, in our, uh, where'd it go, Dra drop area, we can also check that. So we get the drop request, we know the drop request goes to, uh, let's see here, where is it? It is, oh, player base, right. Um, where is it that we're doing the other thing though? That was in the function in, oh, that's right, ship drop zone, that's what it is. This is where we get our drop request. So we can do this now. If not has character and we do request.data.player.can drop, or can move, excuse me. Now, what you don't see under the covers here is can drop always starts off in every request as false. And that makes it so it's an opt-in. You have to always set it to true if you're able to drop it. This doesn't cancel the drop, but what it, I mean, it, it will cancel the drop, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't prevent you from selecting in the first place. So how do we do that? Is that possible? Let's see, I actually, something I'm learning as we speak. So 
but merely doing this, maybe what I could do is say, if not can move, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, well, first of all, I'm just going to put return. But secondly, let me see here. I'm pretty sure there is a cancel somewhere. Let me look this up. So unless I'm mistaken, it does not really look like there's a way to do this aside from perhaps forcing it by sending a canceled event. I can do that. So if I say, let's see here, get window dot Send input. Let me see here. What is it? I thought it was send. Okay, well, we don't want cancel free. That's obvious. Um, input. try set input as handled and say true and just immediately return oh I may not even need it let's see what that does Remember, we have our timer on it. So it looks like it won't allow us to drop it, but it does allow us to drag it. So that's not quite what we want. Let's see here. A little bit surprised not to see cancel drag anywhere. So my assumption is we're going to have to... somehow forcibly send it, which I know can be done. I think it's just using input. Let me see here. Notify. Okay, so I can forcibly send a notification this way. So what I'll do then is this. 
what is going to be actually have this used in what is it is it a drag control oh it's just drag end okay and reversed we'll just leave it as false so in theory forcibly sending this notification should work but first we move our little guy Ah, it did not work. Hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we can do with this. Let me think about this for a minute then. Maybe we'll just leave it for now, actually. Let me do that. We'll just leave it for now. Um... And we'll just have it um, essentially allow you to look like it's dragging, but you can't put it anywhere. Um, that'll be, I think, probably the simplest thing that we can do. Um, so, all right, now let's see, what else do we want? So now we're prevented from doing it. After three seconds, it should work. We can test that real quick. Okay, so I'll move my character here too. A few seconds. Oh, let's see if I can still move it. Looks like not, and there's a specific reason why. Obviously, I made a mistake. In my player base, when the timer happens, can move equals true. You have to go back to true. That sounded like I planned it. I absolutely did not. Oh boy, this would be a loss. <laughs> now we're waiting, waiting, waiting. And look, we can move again now. Very nice. But now we can't. If we try to drop it early enough, we can't. If it's on time, we're good. And it always goes back to where it showed up, or where it was before. Okay. So that's super cool. All right, so next up, I think what we're going to do, so now this has the timeout for the player. That tells us how we can do the timeout for our enemies as well. It's basically going to be the exact same thing. Okay, so let's look at that then. Let's go into our enemy. And there's not really anything special here. It's actually exactly the same as the player. Difference being that um, there's no drag and drop. It's just going to move on its own. So we're going to put a script on it. This is on our base enemy. Let's figure out what we need here. First off, we're going to need access to... Let's see here. Probably the area. So, maybe we can just connect to that directly and say, uh, let's do area entered, connect. And just call take damage. And we'll put in the area that was thing.damage. And then we'll also do, actually, you know what? Yeah, let's do a, um, we go types, we can do types.weapon type. So that's now our type. And we say uh, area dot, well, we'll just call it weapon type. So now we know what the type is going to be. So we can have take damage now. So damage is going to be probably an integer. Weapon type, as we saw, 
is types dot length. And I showed this very briefly earlier, but um, all that is is an enum that I have defined in this types. Now, because I have a class name on it, I don't have to make this node a singleton in order to access this stuff. You can just do it by types. So I have types dot weapon type in my script, and that just works. You can do types dot weapon type, you know, like if types dot weapon type equals, or I should say, if weapon type dot bullet you know do XYZ whatever it happens to be now we're going to do an export here for the enemy hit points that'll be in it itself uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say if enemy HP minus damage is less than or equal to zero, then we're actually going to do a hit. And I mentioned, I think there was someone earlier asking, I remember there was somebody earlier asking about my special effects library. Well, we're going to use that now. It's really simple to use and uh, I'm pretty excited about showing off how it's done. What we're going to do is, um, let's see here, I don't know if I have a fade effect. I have a particles effect and an explosion. Let me see what the explosion does because I don't remember. It's just a particle effect with something and I have an explosion from my artist Kaishido so let me see what that looks like as well. Assets. Hello, Captain Fubar. It's going super well. Thanks for joining. So my explosion looks... Okay, so it's animated. And it looks super awesome. So it doesn't look like I'm going to make this into... Am I winning? No. Never winning. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make this into just an animated sprite rather than a particles because clearly this is not a, a particles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, other node animated sprite. We call it explosion scene. And for that, I'm just going to go sprite frames new. This is all stuff we've probably all done. I'm going to make the explosion very fast. Let's say, ah, let's just go with 16. That's pretty fast. I'll have it be automatic. Um, go to my assets, select this. I didn't see how many it was. It's only one vertical. See here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It looks like maybe. Let's see if that looks right. I think that looks right, right? Yeah, it's got to be. So then I'll just hit select all, hit add frames. And what I'm going to do actually is a little bit of a kind of an interesting thing here because I've seen something before that looked really freaking neat. And uh, Captain Fubar, just for your info, the Script Factor plugin is a plugin that I've been working on a little bit, not too much, um, but to make refactoring scripts in Godot much, much faster. So you can just take like, I'll just explain it. Um, you know when you have like a dollar sign Sprite 2D and you have that just all littered throughout your script? Well, this would let you uh, very easily just select it, say two variable. You just hit a shortcut on the keyboard, hit the two button, put in the name for that you want for it, automatically converts it throughout the entire script to that value, um, and makes you makes the variable for you. It's absolutely I, I love it. It's so nice. Um, so I'm going to close this explosion.gd because we don't need it. Hit 
pass here for the time being. Um, in my sprite frames, which I forgot to do. So you can actually change the duration of things. So what I'm gonna do here actually is I'm gonna put this to eight instead of uh, 16. For this first one, I'm gonna, oops, where'd it go? Did I just find a, I may have found a bug. <laughs> um, for this one, I'm gonna leave it actually at one. Yeah, it looks like I did, excellent. Um, this is a Godot bug, this has nothing to do with my stuff. Um, we keep losing the sprite frames. Um, this one, I'm also gonna do one. So that's eight, so it's a little bit slower. Um, it's not exactly a linter, but it is close. It does do type checking, or not type checking, but it does do some checking. And uh, it is pretty close to that, though. Um, I would like to make it into a full linter, honestly. But uh, the Godot team has plans to add something like this already to the engine. So I might be helping with that. So we'll see. Um, I would like to, for sure. So I'm going to leave the first one at uh, 1x duration as well. Um, or actually, let's see here. Do I want... Yeah, let me do it this way. Let me first change this to 16. Remind me, by the way, toward the end of this to update this to um, make it so that uh, I will put in, the, uh, put in the bug for the sprite frames thing for the frame duration here. Um, for this, I'm going to make it be... It's going to start off this for a longer period of time. So I want it to last for about three frames, I think. This is so annoying. And this one, we're actually going to put maybe four frames. And these will all be the same number of just one frame. And I think that's how it's going to work. Let me look at it and make sure that it looks exactly how I'm planning. Yeah, there's like a little pause, and then the explosion goes off. Um, I think I'm going to actually make the first one not even. Yeah. Agreed, Captain Fubar, and that's my, my intent. I've got it as pure GD script add-on at the moment. You can find it there. Um, at the same time, I would rather have it built in, so I'm probably going to either help the, uh, the GD script team implement that, uh, or at least maybe make a first pass at it, and uh, if somebody wants to like improve it from there, you know, that would be kind of cool. So one thing that's really cool about special effects is um, when you have a flash, you often want to make it last just longer compared to the rest of it. I think it's a little bit too long right now. Yeah, there we go. Ooh, that is nice. Look at that juice. I bet um, uh, what's your name would be proud of me. <laughs> uh, the special effects person in the, uh, in the scene. She's awesome, by the way. If you if you don't follow her, go find her. She does the uh, she does a lot of shader development and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm just gonna save this in scenes. And I'll put it in. I don't know. Special effects. Let's do. We'll have explosion scene here. And now I'll just show you how to do how to use my special effects library because it's not difficult. Um, so that's honestly a question that I would ask um, Kaishido, who might be here. I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, he's my art director. I generally probably wouldn't. I would design the explosion to scale properly in pixel art. And I think that's probably what Kaishido would say as well. Um, it's certainly something you could do, um, and my special effects library supports just about anything you can think of, very simply. Um, so I think what I'll do, let me look at my actual library because some of the functionality for it is a little bit complicated. Um,
Okay, here we go. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Yeah, exactly. I probably prefer that in the texture myself. Because you don't want to get like distortions and stuff that might happen with the scaling. Um, especially if it's like a really nice texture that uh, has a lot of detail, like my explosion does. So if you look in uh, my special effects library, I've got this add weightable effect. And what that does is it takes any of these effects and puts them into an item, basically, that can track whether or not it's actually working, like if it's actually done yet. Um, and it does that by listening to the effect completed. So what I need to do is just go into um, So it looks like I don't have an animation one. I've got a damage shader, but that one works differently. So let me just add it while we're talking. I'm just going to go ahead and add a new scene. I'm going to say, um, we're going to take this, go to animation player. Is this what I want? Hang on. Sorry, let me just think about this for a second. No, we're actually going to want a... Uh, I'm going to make it a sprite. Actually, it could just be my sprite. Now that I'm thinking about it. I'll just make a custom effect. That's what I'll do. Sorry. A little bit all over the place here because I wasn't necessarily sure how far I was going to get today. Let me go find my actual thing here, my explosion. Special effects. Um, there it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new thing. Let's see here. Do I have special effect? No. Um, so I have to do this a little bit differently. Um, let me see what my effect inherits so that I can do that. Okay, I've got effect C. So that's what I need to inherit. I'm actually up one. So I'll inherit this. And then I will immediately rename it to um, Texture Explosion. And the first thing I'll do here is actually extend the script. This is something that a lot of people forget. Let me save it first. I'm not going to save it in there. I'm going to save it here so that I know it's a custom one. But then I, when I hit extend script, the nice thing is it puts it in the folder for me. And I'll just keep it as texture explosion. I notice it inherits effect here as well. So I get effect completed that comes along with it, as well as start effect. And so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to add... Yeah, I can do that. Give me a second here. So my mic volume is pretty much all the way up. I'll tone the uh, desktop audio down a little bit. Is that any better? How's that sound, Captain Fubar? Conversely, I can also change the music to one of my other ones. Yeah, you know what? Let me let me just change the music for now. This has been pretty good. It's from MacGyver, the game that uh, sort of put my little potato sack games on the. Uh, on the uh, scoreboard, I would say, or on, you know, whatever. Let me do Dread Gamble for now. This is another one that uh, we placed very highly in Good Old Wild Jam number 55. Um, so this should start up. Um, I forget. Let me see what the music is like in game. Okay, well, looks like it's the same thing, so I'll just leave it on this. Okay, so let's see here. So I've got my texture explosion effect. I will add my actual explosion, which I call explosion scene. Okay, this is an animated thing, so what I'll do is I'll say at unready var explosion, explosion scene. 
and then rather than ready, I will say start effect. And we'll come back here and we see it takes the parent node. Okay, so I think, if I'm not mistaken for this, we don't actually care about the parent node. Uh, let me double check my other things. That one's a little bit off. Yeah, let me check my stretch, for example. Parent node. Okay, so the parent node is just the thing which exists. So actually, I'm going to use it. And what I'm going to say is, um, that's not what I wanted at all. I'm going to say parent node dot add child this or self, excuse me. And what's going to happen now is this will get added to my parent node. So sounds very normal, right? Um, and I'm just going to sort of ignore that for now because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, effect actually I'm not even going to do that hang on here we add that then we start it that's what it is explosion dot start and I think is it just start with these no, I didn't want that. Ah, it's play, my mistake. Okay. All right, so we hit play, play, rather. Right. Um, and one thing to note, I can't remember, I think I set this to autoplay. I actually didn't want. Okay, so now we're playing automatically as soon as we're added. Um, now what we're going to do is in ready, actually, we say explosion dot animation finished dot connect on animation finished. Now we have our on animation finished. Um, so I, my special effects library sort of handles putting it where it needs to go automatically. For this particular one, it's a little bit different. Oh, I might still have it showing something. I apologize if I do. Let me. Yeah. Uh, that had to do with the fact that I was showing the game, which is in a different thing, so sorry about that. Um, I have, it should be gone now, Lorenzus, or Lorenz Zeus, excuse me. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing it out. Anytime you see that, let me know. Um, because the game runs in a separate window, I have to add it. But when I close the game, it goes back to trying to find a window that matches, and the closest is the editor, so it's a little bit ugly. Um... So put animation here, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Go back to it. Um, animation finished. Oh, this one doesn't have it. OK, interesting. I would have expected. So the animation player does have a string passed in. This one does not. So I'll just put this as nothing void and now what I will say is effect completed dot emit yeah exactly okay now that we have this effect completed dot emit let me just make sure it doesn't take anything yeah that's right okay um, and this is all of our special effect this is how I implement 90% of my things like this and the reason it's going to work I'll show you that in a moment here. Um, 
is uh, because effect completed, when it fires, I'll be listening to that. When it fires, automatically deletes this thing from it. Uh, one thing I got to do is uh, try to center. Actually, you know what? I probably don't have to center this. It'll probably be okay uh, because all of the images are in the center, and so it should be fine. Okay, so no, uh, not strictly. I do have one in this particular project, but I do not use an event bus. I use a special uh, node that I myself have made that automatically deletes any node that you want it to when uh, any particular event you want goes off, any particular signal, excuse me. I can show that again here in a moment because I'm about to get into it. Um, let me just find out where I want this. <laughs> so I go special effects dot add weightable effect. <coughs> The effect is preload, and that's going to be my explosion, texture explosion, and the canvas item in this case is going to be sprite 2D. I guess I have to instantiate this. Um, I actually wouldn't say it's specific to this project. Uh, the, the special effects library is technically publicly available. You can get it in, um, if you go to uh, github slash potato sack games. Um, I don't have anything like that in there right now, Captain Fubar, um, but um, it's definitely something I could do. The library that you're going to see if you go to the Potato Sack Games uh, GitHub repository is not quite as advanced as what I'm actually using here, so I'd actually recommend if you're going to get it, get this one instead. But um, a lot of the basics are there. It's a template repo, so you can just hit like build a new uh, repo off of it, and you get special effects, you get um, like mouse over sounds, you get bunch of new nodes that I've made. You get a lot of stuff, a lot of singletons. Um, all stuff that I've found are useful for making a game. And it puts it into uh, your own repository. You can put it private on your own uh, place, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, that is already actually in project here. So that's where this one is found. And that includes the actual topic that I'm talking about, which is plugins. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is not all plugins have to be actual plugins. Like this special effects library, it's just loaded as a, a singleton. That, in my mind, is sort of like a plugin. Plugins typically will use tools, like the at tool keyword, to functionally um, add actual capabilities to the engine. But, I mean, plugins can be for games too, and that's sort of how I think of it. So, um, Lorenz, Zeus, and Captain Fubar. I don't think you guys were here for the beginning. You folks, excuse me, were here for the beginning of the uh, the stream. You're gonna want to catch it if you can because uh, it shows off the actual plugin stuff more. And somewhere around the middle of the stream, or maybe 12 my time, so about 20 minutes ago. Um, I showed how to make your own plugin, and I just whipped it up within seconds. Um, so it's it'll be in there in the uh, repository once I'm done with this stream. I'm planning to upload all this. Everything is there now, but uh, I've made some changes live that will also be there um, once as soon as I'm done here. So um, yeah, I've got this thing called Add Weightable Effect, and what that references is my free awaitable ref counted and so what it does is it takes any target the way add weightable effect takes any node and uh, in this case an effect um, so the beginning of the the thing and the thing with the the middle um, those things are strictly engine slash tool plugins um, 
for this one, script factor for my refactoring tool, that's purely an engine plugin. And it's something that you'll get when you look in the, uh, in the repository. Um, what I'm talking about with the special effects, that feels more like just a game specific plugin. Um, to build plugins for games is a different thing altogether, but uh, it's actually not that difficult, especially with Godot. Um, the one thing you have to be careful about, of course, is safety concerns. So if you're, if you're allowing like dynamic code to be put in, then you have to make sure that your users aren't going to um, blow up your application or something. Um, so in any case, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Um, so the, the actual, yes, and Captain Fubar, that is something that I myself want to work on. Um, however, I have not had a chance to do it yet, so um, we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, the free awaitable just uses this, and it, um, let's see here, what does it do? Uh, it just listens automatically to this signal and says, when that happens, free the target. So it's actually very simple, very straightforward. Um, for the actual application of the special effect, here we are, um, all it does is it takes the effect, and notice it, in this case, it's actually adding it. So I probably don't even need to do that, actually. So I can go back to my um, actual effect and not even add it. So that already happens uh, when it's done correctly through this. Um, so it creates this awaitable, and then it just calls start. And by this point, the effect itself has already been, you've already gotten the effect completed. So you pass in the effect so they can keep a reference to it so it doesn't blow up. And then you pass in the effect completed as well. And then as soon as this fires, this gets deleted from the scene tree. And that's automatic via the free awaitable type, as you can see here, cube free. Okay, so let's, we can't actually get it to happen. Let me, um, let me just make this work a little bit here. Funk ready void. And I'm going to say await get tree dot create timer. I'm going to say like three seconds, uh, three seconds timeout. And then uh, I'll say... Our rand chance equals, I'm just going to say uh, rand i mod 2, and then if rand chance equals 0, we're going to take damage. I'm going to say 1, and I'll just pass in types dot weapon type, oops, dot bullet, it doesn't really matter. Now this should make it so some of my enemy ships just blow up after three seconds. So let's see how that works. Um, I'm actually going to add time to it so that I can get the uh, get the thing showing correctly in the meantime. Let's see what happens. Okay, I have it on looping, but it clearly worked. Let me take off looping. Let me get rid of this again. This is from my actual explosion. There it is. And we don't want automated on anymore. Um, I believe I can just do that, right? Yeah, I think the default 
default is the main animation, so that should work then. Okay, let's try this again real quick. Turn this on. Yep, so you see the explosion. Now, if we look in the actual editor, and in the actual thing here, So that's another enemy. Let me see. I don't know which one's actually exploded. <laughs> uh, but if we look in these ships here, these should all be ships. Um, there shouldn't be. Okay, that's all the good ships. Yes. There's no nodes attached to them. And that's because it hit my code fired effect completed, deleted it from the same tree. So now that we have it getting rid of that from the same tree and not leaking that, we can go into here and in our enemy base, when that happens, after the explosion happens, we can actually go and say, we can do a queue free. Um, let me think if I want to do that. Yeah, I think so. So that's not quite exactly right. One thing you'll note here about my weightable effect is uh, we actually probably want it to return the effect so I can also tell when it's done. So I don't want a queue free yet. Let me do it this way. Let me put in sprite 2D dot hide first. And to show off for the new people um, what I was saying earlier, you know what I have these two Sprite 2Ds here. I don't have it anywhere else, but that's fine. What I'm going to do is I hit Alt, left quote, or tilde on some keyboards. And you'll note I, it comes up with a little helper um, thing here. And I'll just hit the number two. It says two variable, and I'll just name it Sprite automatically created it at the top, it recognized that it needed on ready, and it replaced it everywhere with that. So that's just one of the things that this tool is really, really useful for. Um, okay, so right now we're just hiding. Uh, what I'm going to do is later, after um, it looks to see if um, it can move, then I'll just queue free it if uh, it's if the sprite is hidden. Um, for now, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, maybe I'll ping Natalie here. I'm starting to get a little bit lightheaded because I need to get food. Um, so, uh, Natalie, if you're listening, it'd be cool if uh, um, if you were able to come back, um, see what you need to say or do. Um, I know a lot of people got added kind of late, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, I got some uh, work stacking up, it looks like, and I need to uh, get some food, so. Yeah, this is mostly about the, uh, the plugin and how to make plugins, so during the stream I actually uh, created a completely new plugin for a drag and drop. Um, I already had the code for it, so that was nice. streaming. I, I don't actually know it's streaming right now. Let me see here. So I saw it said, ah, yes, uh, 
Expired Popsicle slash Kiki is streaming. Do we want to raid them? 